March, we staged the first ever cross-partisan presidential debate during the primary. We had 18 candidates representing 10 political affiliations from across the political spectrum that came together to demonstrate that real political debate is possible in this incredibly diverse nation, uh, grounded in respectful and constructive dialogue. These candidates articulated their competing ideas, values, and visions for the United States. And we have three of them from March that are here today, again, as well. Today, we have five presidential contenders that are joining us in Denver for another open presidential debate. With the Commission on Presidential Debates reeling in from its poor stewardship of the debate process, today's cross partisan debate is an opportunity for the nation to advance a much more meaningful political discourse, one that represents our deep yearnings for a more perfect union. We would like to begin this debate with a brief acknowledgement that we are gathered here on the lands of Native Americans. This land has been stewarded by the Arapaho, Cheyenne, Ute, and Oshati Shakowin nations, among many others. Through force and coercion, indigenous people have been both removed from and relocated to this region. We invite you to honor this struggle as we consider the past, present, and future of what we call the United States of America. Very sadly, the world lost an important champion for equal elections of peace and justice and of many interconnected issues when Kevin Zeese passed away last month. Most recently, Kevin was a hard, working, a hard at work fighting the extradition of Julian Assange, which would have devastating implications for journalism and truth seeking. I had the honor of knowing and working with Kevin for well over a decade, 15 years, who was an incredible mentor for many people, an activist fighting to make the world a better and brighter place. He was a real warrior for liberty and for equal justice under the law. He artfully challenged the Commission on Presidential Debates, unjust monopoly on the presidential debates, and he graciously extended his warmth and wisdom to me and so many others. We will hear shortly now a live stream pre-recorded from his life partner and co-partner, uh, that is, um, Mark Margaret Flowers, who is announcing that Kevin Zeese Emerging Activist Fund to connect, continue his legacy. We here at Free and Equal Elections and Open the Debates think one fitting tribute of his life and legacy would be to make this the year we finally break free from the stranglehold of the two parties in our country. So here's Margaret Flowers. Hi, I'm Margaret Flowers. And I want to thank Christina and Eli for offering me the opportunity to speak to you for a few moments about my life partner, Kevin Z who died unexpectedly on September 6th. Kevin Zeese was a public interest lawyer with a more than 40 year career advocating for a broad range of issues. And he was a strong supporter of third parties and of bringing out the truth and of creating a real democracy. Throughout his lifetime, Kevin participated in so many different issues and he mentored literally hundreds of people and participated in broad coalitions across the country. And so to honor his memory, his family and I have started the Kevin Zeese Emerging Activists Fund and we'll be launching that with a birthday gala celebration on October 28th, which would have been Kevin's 65th birthday. You can learn more about that at popularresistance.org, which is an organization that Kevin and I co-directed. Kevin was a strong supporter of your work at Open the Debates because he, throughout his, his time, he used every tool that he could think of to expose the fact that the presidential debates in this country are a sham, that the commission is really a private corporation run by the Democrats and Republicans and designed to exclude all other voices and candidates. And he understood that without you know, a public, a broad public discourse, not a discourse that's constrained to what the corporate elites will allow to be heard, we can't have a democracy if people aren't informed about the issues and don't understand that they have other choices than the corporate duopoly. So he would be really proud of the work that you're doing and would want to remind you that each one of you is a historical actor in this struggle to open up the public discourse in this country and to create the possibility of a better future. He often reminded us 
that we fail and we fail and we fail, but each time we fail, we're building strength. We're building a stronger movement. And one day, we will win. You never know how close you are. So go forward with that courage and that encouragement and do the work that you're doing because one day, we will win. Thank you. Thank you. Our debate sponsors include Nexus, Independent Voter Project, Taxpayers United of America, the Foundation for Harmony and Prosperity, the Center for Election Science, Collective Evolution, and AMA Healing. Uh, AMA as a Elevate is an all-natural organic hemp elixir that offers a mood-enhancing effect to any beverage, providing a perfect way to relax and unwind without alcohol. Rather than dulling the senses, their elixir enhances the present moment, inviting vibrant social energy while providing a number of health benefits. So if you want to learn more about their products, you can visit amahealing.co slash elevate. Free and Equal and our partner, which I mentioned, one of our sponsors, uh, we are pleased to present a demo of our soon-to-be-launched blockchain voting app, which will promote transparency and empower voters with information about all of their candidate choices. The blockchain election system app, powered by Nexus, is designed to promote transparency in the U.S. electoral process, inspire individuals to run for office, empower voters with information about the electoral system, and educate them on all of their candidate choices. Uh, blockchain voting will transform our voting systems and bring transparency to the electoral process. Future plans include integrating app fo functionality using alternative voting methods. We aim to level the playing field by providing an informational, educational, empowering, inspiring, decentralized info hub beyond traditional social media. So I'd like to show that short promo video. The Free and Equal organization has partnered with the blockchain company Nexus to bring an immutable and transparent method of voting to the current electoral process. A blockchain contains eternal data, which is accessible at any point in the future without fear of alteration. Polls and their votes are pieces of data that are recorded and transferred on the blockchain in an accurate and transparent manner to ensure the integrity of the results of the vote. Creating polls as an administrator on the blockchain has been made simple. The administrator's account has an address that will store all of the polls and the votes that are casted to them. When a poll is created, it will be stored at the administrator's address with its creation being timestamped on the blockchain. The administrator will also be able to view any of their previous polls regardless of how recent or dated the creation was. The votes on each poll are then counted and results are displayed to the administrator. A voter will be able to see a list of polls created by the administrator and choose one to vote on. When capturing the vote, the blockchain searches for identifying information from both the voter and the poll to ensure that a duplicate vote is not being cast. Once the blockchain verifies this information, the vote will either be accepted to the poll total or not allowed if it is a duplicate vote. A publicly verified blockchain cannot be manipulated. It ensures every legitimate vote is counted and that duplicate votes will not be. One person, one vote, publicly verifiable. To find out more information, visit freeandequal.org and nexus.io. Thank you. So we're going to go into the format. Before we do, I just want to announce to all of our United We Stand art artists and everybody listening out there and to all of the candidates um, we're going to, uh, to an open bar and party at Lester Pearl downtown after the debate to mingle and meet with the local press. And members, we can take a bus from here and it will be returning to the Source Hotel after the party is over. So we're going into the format for the debate, which will be a variation of the cumulative time format. This has actually been created by the League of Women Voters and a format we've been using for every single one of our debates since 2008, 12, 16, and now 20. After a brief introduction by the moderator, which has happened, each candidate will have an opportunity to make an opening statement of two minutes. The order for the statements will be determined at random. Between four and ten questions will be asked, depending on the number of confirmed candidates for the debate. Candidates will have two minutes to answer each question each candidate will have a total of three more opportunities to take one additional minute to offer a rebuttal 
or expand upon their previous question. For instance, you could use your extra minute on the first of three questions, or you could save them for the last three questions. You may use any of your extra minutes on the same question after each candidate has had the opportunity to use one. In order to encourage a free exchange of ideas, that is, extra minutes do not carry on into the closing statements, and each candidate will be permitted a two-minute closing statement. So we're going to go ahead and start with a two-minute opening statement for each candidate. Uh, Brian Carroll, the American Solidarity Party, please. Yes, I am Brian Carroll, representing the American Solidarity Party. I am a retired school teacher. I spent most of my career in junior high, but other levels as well. And I spent most of my career teaching uh, U.S. history, constitution. I spent most of it in California. I also taught nine years on a mission station in Columbia, and I taught one summer English in China. The American Solidarity Party uh, is whole life, for pro-life for the whole life. Uh, we oppose abortion. We oppose assisted suicide. We oppose uh, capital punishment. Uh, we want to see uh, the kind of a society that means a woman is not pushed into a divor abortion. She wants to have that child, and we can support it and help her know that she can be successful uh, raising that child. Uh, we also are strongly in favor of uh, social justice. We believe that communities, uh, strong communities are built around strong families and strong economy, strong local economy, local businesses. Uh, we want to see a, a diversified economy that is especially local. And we want to see improvement in our uh, environment. We want to see climate change addressed uh, very rapidly. And we want to work for a more peaceful uh, country. We are the American Solidarity Party. We're about nine years old. This is our third cycle putting a candidate in for president. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Brock Pierce, Independent. I see you. I acknowledge your bravery and recognize the courage it takes to be an independent, especially in times such as these. I am Brock Pierce, and I am showing up in service of our great nation and humanity. I'm running for president of the United States of America as an independent candidate because I am deeply concerned about the future of our nation and the world. As a father of two young daughters, I look around and if you see what I see, if you feel what I feel, then you likely share my concern about our collective future. I believe we are doomed if we don't do something, something different. What has served us in the past will no longer serve us in the future. The two-party system that our nation's founders warned us against is not serving the American people. We are divided politically, economically, racially, while facing existential threats environmentally, technologically, while in conflict with other nations. The two-party system is incapable of solving these problems. Our nation needs independent, highly skilled, visionary leaders to reunite and lead America back into the light so we can be the bastion of hope, the beacon of freedom, and the leader of innovation to provide the 21st century solutions so that we may overcome the challenges we face. We have often identified ourselves more with what we stand against than what we stand for. It is time to say who we are rather than who we are not. It is time for us to truly mean all of us. Thank you, Brock. Gloria Lariva with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for having this debate. My name is Gloria Lariva. I live in San Francisco, California, originally from New Mexico. I am the candidate in 13 states for the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and I'm the candidate for the Peace and Freedom Party in California, for the Liberty Union Party in Vermont. Um, I received the highest votes in 2016 of any socialist in the 40 years before. Our party is active in more than 100 cities in this country, growing very largely and quickly in the last four years because of so many youth, especially, 
who see that capitalism does not work for them or the rest of the people, who are very fearful about the danger of war and who've participated in many of the actions we've seen. Our party is active from Portland to Rochester, New York, to Los Angeles, to even Burlington, Vermont, fighting racism and police terror. Um, we believe that a job or income, housing, education, health care should be an absolute constitutional right. Nobody should have to pay a penny for health care. And it's completely possible in the richest country in the world. The problem is capitalism. The problem is the billionaires and now trillionaires who make billions and hundreds of billions in this pandemic and don't pay a penny. We think that this pyramid in which the tiny 0.1% at the top should be reverted in where the masses of people who create all the wealth should share, should own that wealth collectively, and share to create an ecological, sustainable economy and save the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gloria. Mr. Don Blankenship with the Constitution Party. I am Don Blankenship, the Constitution Party candidate for president, and uh, again, I, I really appreciate that they're having this uh, this debate and uh, the organization for fair elections. Uh, what I'd like to do first is propose to Joe Biden that I will pay his son Hunter a million dollars if he will debate me personally on national television, both in the interest of the American public. Uh, hearing the truth and in the interest of establishing that third-party candidates should be listened to. Uh, I will do the same thing on behalf of uh, or with Donald Trump, uh, and I will offer him the opportunity to interrupt me as many times as he would like and to have uh, an opportunity to have twice the time in closing and opening that I have. The thing that this country needs more than anything else is to return to the principles that made it great to begin with. Most of those principles are contained in the Constitution of the United States, and a lot of the principles are contained in things that the founders said uh, in and around that. As Brock mentioned, one of the things that uh, is most uh, troublesome in this country is the two-party system. Uh, I can tell you firsthand that it's worse than most people realize because it's not only the two-party system, it's the establishment uh, media which supports the two-party system and is beholding to the two-party system, as well as what are called Hill Committees, which allows the government and those two parties to raise hundreds of millions of dollars to use in these campaigns and makes it nearly impossible for them to lose. So we badly need major change, and the foundation of that change is back to the future and back to the Constitution. Thank you, Don. Howie Hawkins, Green Party. Thank you. Thanks for having this forum. My name is Howie Hawkins. I'm the Green Party candidate. I'm a retired Teamster. I live in Syracuse, New York. I spent 50 years working on construction sites and in warehouses. But that was to pay the bills. What I've really been about is social movements for justice and ecology and peace. I came up in the San Francisco Bay Area. It was civil rights, anti-Vietnam War, the early ecology movement. And I concluded back then that the people need their own party because we got these two corporate parties that don't represent what we want. So I got involved well, when the Green Party started in 1984. I've stayed involved since then. Green Party in New York has run me three times for governor. Each time we got enough votes to get a ballot line. And I guess because of that, a lot of Greens around the country asked me to run for president. So here I am. And we framed our campaign around three life or death issues. The climate emergency. And I was the first candidate to campaign for a Green New Deal in this country back in 2010. We're campaigning now on an eco-socialist Green New Deal, emphasizing public ownership and planning in key sectors so we can get to 100% clean energy and zero to negative greenhouse gas emissions in 10 years, because that's what the climate science says we got to do. And as part of our Green New Deal, we're dealing with the next existential crisis. That's growing inequality. Working class life expectancies are in decline in this country. That's inexcusable. So we have an economic bill of rights, the right to a job, an income above poverty, Medicare for all, public housing and education, lifelong, and a secure retirement by increasing Social Security benefits so nobody 
who's a senior is living in poverty. And so these are positions the majority of people support. I'm ready to debate Biden and Trump, but I don't think they're ready to debate me. So thank you for this forum. Thank you so much, Howie. Uh, we're going to jump right into our first question, and we alternate. Uh, first question will be Brock, second, Gloria, and so on in uh, order. And our first question, uh, a video uh, from Cindy Sheehan, known her a decade, anti-war activist, and uh, she was actually nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, met her at the Open D Debates Rally for Ralph Nader back in 2008, actually. So she has a question, question for the candidates, and Brock will be the first to answer. Hi, this is Amy Sheehan. I'm sending greetings from Smoky and Hot, Northern California. I hope wherever you are, you are well and you're able to breathe fresh air, unlike us out here. Anyway, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the candidates for being in this people-centered debate based on issues, not on uh, personalities or kind of fake divisions um, from the ruling class. I am an anti-war activist. I'm an anti-war activist because in 2004, my son Casey was killed in Iraq um, on April 4th. He was a soldier for the US military. And of course, uh, we're in the working class, no middle class about it. And Casey was the oldest, and he wanted to join to earn his college money, which you know I believe, and probably some of the candidates there believe, that education is a human right, and we shouldn't have to go into lifelong debt or um, go into the military to be able to get a college education. <laughs> to me, that is the most important issue. If we don't end the wars, if we don't end U.S. imperialism, how are we going to have a, a health care, a rational health care system? How are we going to have education from preschool to university as a human right, not as a privilege for the 1%? How are we going to have a sustainable economy, a sustainable ecology if those um, criminals in uh, the Democrat or Republican Party keep on, um, keep the stranglehold they have over our, our politics and over society uh, that they do here, and really all over the world. If the United States is healthy, then I believe that brings a healthier planet. And my question to you is, um, what are your feelings about the occupation of Afghanistan, and that's we're just talking about Afghanistan. We're not, it's the longest foreign U.S. war um, in our history. Of course, not the longest war in U.S. history, but the longest foreign war in U.S. history. As President of the United States, what would you do about Afghanistan? I look forward to watching this, and I look forward to hearing your answers. Peace. All right, Brock, please. Mr. Pierce. Well, thank you for the excellent question. War is always a challenging subject and something we should never take lightly, something that great consideration should occur before entering into it uh, because the lines are not always clear. In the context of Afghanistan, we've been there a long time. It's unclear whether or not we're having a positive impact. We probably are not. And the question is, how do we exit? And how do we exit as gracefully as we can under the present circumstances? But I think the objective in Afghanistan is to get out, but also to leave the people of Afghanistan in the best position possible, hopefully in a position where they can self-govern and thrive. And. Uh, I think that's the answer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ms. Lariva. Yes, thank you very much for the question, Cindy. I agree very much with you. My party and my campaign believe that all U.S. troops must be withdrawn from every base in the world, shut down the more than 800 military bases without any hesitation. 
taking the troops out of South Korea so that the people of Korea can be reunited again. When a country is occupied by the United States, it cannot be truly free. And that goes for Afghanistan, that goes for Iraq, that goes for part of what used to be Yugoslavia. I have seen the effects of US war and sanctions. I traveled three times to Iraq between 1997 and 2001 to see more than one million people who had died from a total US blockade of Iraq. Why? For the US to take control of the oil and a strategic ge geopolitical um, domination of the Middle East. Now they've overthrown Libya and created a hellhole for the people. I believe that the people of the world must be able to decide their own destiny. And part of that foreign policy is also stopping all US military aid to Israel. Stop oppressing the Palestinian people. The people must have the right in Palestine to self-determination. And uh, I made a video about Iraq, by the way. It's called Genocide by Sanctions, the Case of Iraq. It won an award for the exposition of what the US had done. And I also call, in terms of international policy, for the US to lift all of the dozens of blockades and sanctions against other countries, including lifting the 60-year blockade of Cuba, let the people breathe, live, and develop, and lift the sanctions, stop the coup attempts against President Maduro and the people of Venezuela. Thank you. Ms. Arriba, uh, Mr. Blankenship. Well, I think that uh, it may be one of the few things that most everybody on this uh, debate panel will agree with. Uh, the United States doesn't need to be in 125 or 130 countries with troops. Uh, Afghanistan, the, the goal is not clear. Uh, it's not the responsibility of American taxpayers to fund uh, the protection of people around the world. And uh, it will never end. It doesn't matter whether we leave now or we leave in 10 years, the circumstances or the, the results of our leaving will be the same. And so we just need to, to not only get out of Afghanistan, but to stop the efforts to police the world that we've been so involved in uh, probably for at least uh, since World War II. And so I would be very much in favor of exiting Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hawkins? Yeah, people call this the longest foreign war, and they think 2001. We got in Afghanistan in 1978 to try to overthrow the government supporting jihadi uh, militants against that government. Brzezinski did that with Carter. That was before the Russians invaded to defend that government. It's been a disaster for Afghanistan. We should provide aid, not arms, and get the hell out of Afghanistan. In all these endless wars, we now have combat troops in 14 conflicts, 800 foreign military bases. So I say we need peace initiatives. Cut the military budget 75%. Bring the troops home to defend our own country, but not meddle in other countries. Pledge no first use of nuclear weapons, and then go to the other nuclear powers with tensions reduced and saying, we got to get rid of nuclear weapons. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has their doomsday clock, the closest it's ever been to midnight. And that doomsday clock been around since the 1940s. Because the U.S. initiated what they call nuclear modernization. New strategic nuclear weapons, more tactical nuclear weapons and conventional forces. With the crazy idea that we can escalate with tactical nukes and then de-escalate, which is crazy. As Daniel Ellsberg wrote in his last book, it's a doomsday machine. Once one nuke flies, they all want to fly, and that's the end of us. So we should have this negotiation go there with world public opinion. 122 nations have agreed to the text of a treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. The International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that achievement. And hardly anybody in this country knows that because of political leaderships of the two corporate parties which support this nuclear modernization in the corporate state media that are like stenographers for these two corporate parties, we won't even talk about it. It should be a top campaign issue. So Afghanistan is just a symptom of militarism and imperialism. And we should get the hell out. Thank you, Howie. And Mr. Carroll. I think there is a lot of agreement, and I appreciate Cindy's question. And Afghanistan, unfortunately, demonstrates that it's a whole lot easier 
to get into a war than to get out of a war. And going back as far as when Jimmy Carter was president, he warned us if we couldn't get off oil, we were going to be constantly in war in the Mideast. And we are. We have to, first of all, uh, get rid of our addiction to oil so that we're not pulled into controversies over there. Uh, and we do. We want to reduce our military all over the place. We have to be careful. Uh, we demonstrated in pulling out of uh, Syria between the uh, Turks and the Kurds that sometimes our pulling out creates additional problems and a vacuum. Somebody rushes in and a lot of people get killed. We want to reduce our military uh, worldwide, but we don't want to uh, create the kind of uh, vacuum, power vacuum, that gets a lot of local people killed. We want to be gentle about it as best we can and pull them out. Uh, and we know that our military budget is bloated. And Eisenhower told us every time we drop a bomb, that's a hospital that we can't build or it's a school we can't build. And we want to redirect our economy into domestic things. Uh, we want to create uh, cities that are livable. We want to create schools that educate kids. We want to create hospitals that meet the needs of all of our people. And that requires reducing our military budget, increasing domestic budget, and that also requires uh, getting ourselves out of a lot of other places that we shouldn't be in. All right. Thank you for your responses, candidates. And so, well, if we're not going to use an extension, we'll move on to our, you want to use one yeah. of your three rebuttals or extensions? Go for it. One minute. There was more to be said. <laughs> <laughs> um, beyond that of Afghanistan, I think clearly the goal is to end conflicts wherever, whenever possible, as quickly as possible, but in a thoughtful, methodical way. We need to look at each one of these on a case-by-case -case basis, on a base-by-base -base basis. Um, one, for example, is Cuba. We should be shutting down Guantanamo Bay, emptying everything there, ending the sanctions on Cuba. But then what do we do in a mutually beneficial way? As we do that, we have that base. There are things that could be done to create economic benefits between both nations, especially with some, so, uh, a nation that is so close to us, uh, and one where we had such long-standing ties. And I, this has to be done in a very thoughtful fa fashion on a case-by-case -case basis to make sure that we don't run into the law of unintended consequences. Thank you, Brock. And so we're going to move on to our second question. Uh, we're going to jump a bit over into electoral reform, reform arena. This is Aaron Hamlin. He's the founder of the Center for Election Science. And I've learned a lot about a Alternative voting methods from this gentleman. He's a sponsor of ours here at Free and Equal Elections for the debate. So thank you to the Center for Election Science. And here's a question uh, from Aaron Hamlin, and Gloria will be the first to respond. Hi, I'm Aaron Hamlin, Executive Director at the Center for Election Science. My question for you is about voting methods, two in particular, approval voting and ranked choice voting both of which have been implemented in U.S. elections. First up, approval voting. Approval voting allows you to approve of as many candidates as you wish. The candidate with the most votes wins. This voting method has the advantage of being quite simple, working on basically the same ballots as we have now and not requiring any kind of special voting machine. The other advantage of approval voting is that it helps third parties and independents. As an example, in 2016, we conducted a survey that used approval voting. So, as you may recall, in 2016, Jill Stein got only 1% under a choose one voting method, the one that we use now, whereas under approval voting, in our poll, she was able to get 9%. Gary Johnson, under the choose one voting method that we use now, uh, was able to get 3%, whereas under approval voting, he was able to get 21%. The other voting method, Instant runoff voting, also referred to now as ranked choice voting or RCV. This voting method allows voters to rank their candidates in order of preference, and it uses those rankings to simulate sequential runoffs. The advantage of ranked choice voting is that it does a good job 
eliminating third party or independent candidates and transferring their votes to major party candidates, particularly in cases when they would otherwise be uh, so-called uh, spoilers. An example of this was RCB's use in Maine in their second congressional district. Their two independent candidates, whose votes totaled roughly 8%, when they were eliminated under ranked choice voting, uh, their votes transferred over to the major party candidates, which avoided a so-called uh, spoiler effect. Now that you know those two particular voting methods, approval voting and ranked choice voting, how do you see voting methods, particularly these, fitting under your platform? Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lariba. Yes, thank you, Aaron, for your question. I agree with you very much. Uh, those are one of the two important reforms, the ranked choice voting and the approved voting, and I appreciate your description of the first, which I had that much knowledge of. I think there's so much more just on the issue of the technology and the process itself of voting. There are many other reforms that we need. First, that we truly have for the, for the candidates equal access to the media. Imagine if we had been on those national debates, how we could have broadened the discussion to really represent the working class and poor people of this country. Also, making it easier to access uh, ballots on the states. It's become so much harder for people to be able to petition to get on the ballots, and state by state by state, that's highly anti-democratic. The Democrats and Republicans do not have that problem. Overturn top two. That really wipes out the right of third parties to have um, to, to appear beyond the primary into the general elections, and also hurts um, candidates who may not be in the top two um, outcome. Provide equal rights for immigrants so that they have the right to work. My mother lived in the United States for 67 years. She was from Mexico, a very proud immigrant. She raised six, six children here. She worked all her life in the US. She contributed all her life. And she never had the right to vote because she wasn't a citizen. She was a permanent resident. Allow prisoners and ex-prisoners in some states who are not allowed to vote, allow youth from 16 to 18 the right to vote, and restore fully the Voting Rights Act, which was debilitated by the, a recent Supreme Court decision. There's so much more. And ultimately, the real democracy will come from a socialist system where the people are in power and can make the real decisions for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Don? I don't know a lot about these different voting methods, but what I will say is that we're taking on the chore of being able to get third party candidates uh, on the in debates and, uh, if you will, visible to the public. And I would not want to dilute that effort by trying to uh, simultaneously make a major change in the way the elections work. I do like runoff elections where you have uh, many candidates on the ballot and uh, basically the top three or four can, if they don't, if no one gets over 50%, has a runoff. I also believe that the election process needs to be made a lot more fair and a lot more, if you will, honest. So there's a lot of things that we need to do. I would be hesitant to engage uh, the public with uh, complicated changes or what they would view as complicated changes in the election process at the same time that we're trying to uh, get a attention to the issues that matter rather than watching what we watched when Biden, when Biden and Trump debated the other night. We need civility like you see here today to discuss these type of things and uh, certainly I'd be willing to study any change in the election process that might matter. But I do think that uh, we need to take one step at a time and one step we need to make is to get more candidates on the ballot. Uh, it's very difficult to get on the ballot and that needs to be improved uh, across the United States with some states making it nearly impossible. <clears throat> so I'm more focused on that. Uh, my experience has been that when you dilute your efforts or complicate what you're trying to do, that you're less likely to be successful. So while I would uh, take a hard look at any approach to election reform, uh, my current focus is on third party candidates getting on the ballot. Thank you, Don. Howie. Well, I just went through 47 primaries to get the green nomination, most of which used ranked choice voting, some used approval voting. And I much prefer ranked choice voting. I think for voters it's much more intuitive. 
particularly when you're electing one person. You rank your choices, one, two, three. It's as easy as one, two, three. In approval voting, people are like trying to game it. Well, maybe we should just cast one vote for the one candidate we want. And when you're trying to determine one winner, approval voting gets things very complicated. So I, I prefer ranked choice voting. And in this presidential race, I'm often told, oh, you're spoiling the election for Biden. And I say, no, he's spoiling the election. The Green Party's been given a proven nonpartisan solution to the possibility of spoiled elections. We've had two of them. George W. Bush was the loser of the popular vote, but the Electoral College installed him with the help of the Supreme Court. Same thing with the loser named Donald Trump. He lost the popular vote by three million votes, and the Electoral College installed him. And the Democratic Party, instead of dealing with that problem, tries to knock us off the ballot. They ain't even solving the problem. So what we need for presidential vote is replace the Electoral College with a ranked choice voting in a national popular vote. Problem solved. Knocking the Green Party off the ballot don't solve the problem, which brings up the issue of fair ballot access. We're off the charts in this country. You want to run for Congress? In most states, it takes thousands or tens of thousands of signatures. You want to run as an independent for the House of Commons in England? It's 10 signatures. For the parliament in New Zealand, it's two signatures. In this country, it's thousands or tens of thousands of signatures. And then people wonder why we only got two parties on the ballot. Because the two parties have set up the laws, so we can't even get on the ballot. So that's a big reform we need. We need full public campaign financing with federal financing called the clean money model. And when you get that money, you've got to get in a public debate. Then we have equal access to debates. And yes, we need the economic democracy of socialism in order to have political democracy. Because as long as you've got concentrated economic power, it translates into concentrated political power, and the rich folks rule. And that's not right. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Brian. Yeah, I fell in love with ranked choice voting about 30 years ago when I was a, on the vote counting committee for a small organization, and I was just amazed at how well it worked. Uh, the difficulty is in educating the populace on how it works, because anytime you introduce something new, uh, people are suspicious. Uh, this year, I ran a commercial, well, I, I boosted a post, Facebook post into Maine to congratulate them on the fact that they were running this year with the ranked choice voting. And, uh, and I was amazed at the comments that I got from people in Maine who were convinced it was a, some kind of a horrible foreign plot from the Russians to end our democracy. Uh, it, it is difficult to train people to something new. And so I want to move forward with ranked choice voting. I'd like to see every state uh, adopt it, but it's going to take a while to train people to do that. And there's lots of different improvements. Uh, blockchain voting is another one that people will have a hard time understanding. It's a good idea, but in a federal system, we can have different states adopt it. We don't have to adopt it nationally all at once. Each state can adopt it on their own schedule. And then uh, other states can look and see how it does, and people can gradually get the idea. We're not going to train everybody all at once. There's going to be resistance. Thank you. Brock? We definitely need some reform in this department. I think we're ready for some changes that hopefully make things more fair. I like both approval and rank choice. I'm supportive of either if states will adopt it. My preference is rank choice, but I think both are a move in the right direction, certainly for independent uh, and third party candidates. But there's a lot of other reforms needed. My background is in building and financing blockchain-based systems, systems that can ensure the integrity of our electoral and democratic process. That's great. It also can improve the accessibility and make it such that you could vote from your phone, which should drive voter engagement you know, from the 43% of eligible voters that are choosing not to participate. Um, ballot access is clearly another issue in this department. Uh, I'm on the ballot in New York, nominated by the Independence Party of New York, I passed on it because it looked nearly impossible. You needed 15,000 signatures. And in the, heart, in the middle of April, as New York was being hit by COVID harder than anywhere in the world, the governor increased the number from 15,000 to 45,000 to ensure that no one could get on the ballot. And also passed a rule that said that if a political party nominates a candidate in New York 
and they don't receive 130,000 signatures or votes in the, um, uh, in the general election, that party is disbanded. Our democracy is under threat. A lot of changes are needed. Opening up the debates, the challenges here with the commission, as we're seeing, grateful for the opportunity. We clearly need to have more platforms like this to drive accessibility. And a reminder to everyone, um, well, media is a challenge as well, but vote. Vote your conscience. The biggest issue we have is ultimately with us. We are the reason this exists this, exists this way. We've been tricked or fooled into believing that we only have two choices. And as long as we continue to make fear-based votes instead of voting our conscience and doing what we believe to be the right thing, we will forever be trapped in this illusion. It's time to break free. Thank you, Brock. I think we have a clear consensus that anything is better than the current voting system. It seems like the current system really feeds into the whole uh, wasted vote fear mongering of you know, don't vote your conscience, vote for the lesser of two evils. So one of many different flaws. So it's, you guys brought up ballot access. I'm pretty passionate about that too. Another um, thing that we need to improve. I mean, in fact, it takes, I think, seven, 800,000 signatures for candidates and independent to get on the ballot versus like 25,000 or so for D's and R's. That is very telling. Talk about a system that has a lot of reform coming in the near future. So just uh, very passionate about those topics. <laughs> um, I want to move on to our next question, uh, which uh, Don will be answering first. And this is from our co-host, Eli Beckerman of Open the Debates. A huge supporter. He was really the spark in really uh, making us, you know, doing a debate before the primary. This this cycle was the first time we've ever done that, and uh, Eli really was the the right hand guy that that made that a reality. And we had 18 candidates from diff 10 different political affiliations, of which three of you are here today from the primary. And so, uh, in any case, um, we cannot wait to hear uh, Eli's question from Open the Debates. Um, please. Hi, I'm Eli Beckerman, and I'm the director of Open the Debates, a cross-partisan effort to open up the political debates of our nation to new ideas, fresh voices, and better choices. Essentially, we're fighting to make America debate again. I'm grateful to each of you for putting yourselves out there as candidates in spite of a very warped playing field designed by the two parties in power to protect themselves from any independent competition. While the Commission on Presidential Debates claims to work for the benefit of the American electorate, it is painfully clear that they have zero interest in serving the public interest. My question for each of you is to describe two or three improvements to the way that we conduct presidential debates that can make them truly serve the American electorate and what kind of impact those innovations might have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Don. Well, I think the first thing that we need to do is uh, find a way to get at least three, if not four, people on the debate stage. So that has to be the goal. When you ask yourself, you know, how do you achieve that goal? I think that groups such as this, uh, perhaps having debates that lead to a candidate being selected by people who are neither part of the Democratic Party or part of the Republican Party, and uh, that would be a large number of people and insisting that that person uh, be in the debates. I think another problem that we have uh, and that we have an opportunity, uh, people like Brock's background and others in the social media to have a fairly uh, well uh, viewed debate. In other words, uh, we could have a debate on, uh, you know, through the social media that would, would have uh, quite a large audience. And uh, essentially how we would do that is we would go through the process as non-Democrat, non-Republicans of determining uh, who the American public wants that's neither a mem not a member of either party. So uh, I would struggle uh, off the cuff with all the things that we could do to cause it to happen. Obviously, uh, at the first of this debate, I offer a million dollars for to Hunter Biden for Joe Biden to debate, uh, but perhaps we could raise the money that uh, you know we could fund our own time on television to do the debates. Uh, but I will tell you that it, the problem is much worse than you realize. Uh, it's not just a two-party system. It's the four large conglomerate corporations that control national television. You know, the companies that most Americans have no idea that control the media, like Disney and AT&T and Comcast. 
And basically, they control the message, they control the debate process, they control uh, what Americans see that they think is news. And uh, that is also a major problem that would have to be addressed to actually get us on the debate stage. Thank you. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Howie. What we need to understand is this Commission on Presidential Debates, it sounds like a government agency, like the Federal Election Commission. In fact, it's a private corporation controlled by the Democrats and Republicans to perpetuate a fraud on American voters. Like they're some kind of official entity. They're a private corporation controlled by the two parties. So they muscled aside the League of Women Voters back in 1988. Dukakis and George H.W. Bush had a contract with each other and they handed it to the league and they said, this is how we're going to do the debates. And the league said, no, 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 we invite you. We pick the moderators, we ask the questions. So the two corporate parties just muscled aside the league who called what they were doing a fraud and they've been perpetuating this fraud on us now since 1988. So we get that mess we saw a couple weeks ago. And they have a contract with each other. We haven't seen this year's contract, but some of them have been leaked. Like in 2012, Mitt Romney said, uh, MSNBC can't have a moderator. So they set these conditions. It's not the way it's supposed to go. So how do we improve it? Well, we got to get civic organizations and news organizations to step up. They should sponsor the debates and invite the candidates, not the other way around. I mean, I've been through this mess. Governor Cuomo in New York, which as somebody mentioned, has tripled how many votes we need just to keep our ballot line under the cover of the COVID pandemic attached to the state budget because he wants to get rid of the competition. That's the kind of nonsense we're going through. So another thing is if we have public campaign financing at the federal level, like I mentioned earlier, that public agency could sponsor debates, which the state of Arizona does now. They have that kind of system. So my fellow Teamster, Angel Torres, running for governor as a Green, in 2018, he got to debate. Cuomo wouldn't debate me. And we shouldn't have the incumbents running their own elections and the debates too. So I think those are two things we can do to uh, improve the debate process. Thank you, Howie. Yeah, we, we, we invite sponsors here at Free and Equal Elections as well for our debates to go mainstream. So thank you for your answer. I really like that a lot. So <laughs> Brian. I'm gonna agree with several comments here. Uh, we have a, a symbiotic relationship between the parties where they feed each other, they depend on each other, and they're not letting anybody else in. And I have been part of debates uh, when I ran for Congress two years ago uh, by the League of Women Voters, and it was well run. Uh, nobody was stepping on anybody else's time or interrupting or arguing or any of that kind of stuff. They were, you know, good questions. Uh, asked respectfully, and the candidates were held to rules, and it went well. Uh, but neither party, neither candidate, uh, had a hand in setting up the rules. They showed up, they were invited to participate in somebody else's debate, and it was the League of Women Voters that set that up. Uh, I also agree the the public financing is a big deal. That's very helpful. Uh, and part of the problem is the networks uh, looking for ratings, they want it to be entertaining uh, as much as educational. And we need to make sure that the main goal is educational. We want voters to understand uh, the differences between candidates. And uh, it's not to pull ratings, it's to educate a population. And I think that's the main, uh, the main things we need to do. Thank you, Brian. Brock. The debates uh, and ideas for how we go about fixing this, I can agree that um, we would be better off if the League of Women Voters were responsible for running the debates again. So we'll just start there. But how does one get into uh, the debates? How does someone get the main debate stage? You need to poll 15% of the popular vote. The problem is when those polls are commissioned and they call someone up, they say, 
would you like to vote for the Democratic candidate or the Republican candidate? And they said, well, I, I want to vote for Brock Pierce. They said, well, well, that's not an option. Are you voting for the Democratic or Republican candidate? Well, I'm, I'm voting for, for Brock Pierce. They say, oh, we're marking you down on decided. So the polls themselves are rigged. The commissioning of those polls are a problem. So that piece alone has to be fair, because right now you can't get to 15%, even if you could. Another issue is maybe we go about a different unit of measurement. Maybe anyone that has, call it, enough ballots, enough ballot access to potentially win, call it 270 points or more, they should be on that debate stage. Or maybe it's anyone that's on 40, 45. Sure, call it 50 different ballots. There should be a different unit of measurement to determine it. Another thing is antitrust. Gary Johnson sued over this issue, but there might be an opportunity to sue on an antitrust basis with the media companies. Clearly, finding a way to create a business model around this is another, but that is not likely to happen. Um, and I guess final, the open debates. How do we get you, how do we get this forum greater distribution so that it can replace that system? You know, and that will ultimately happen when you, the voters, start to vote differently, when you start to vote your conscience. And so I invite you to do that. And thank you once again for facilitating all of this. Thank you very much, Brock. Gloria. I think that it's a much deeper question and answer than just how to improve the voting process. Certainly there can be reforms, but in this country and in this system, money talks. It takes tens of millions of dollars to become a member of Congress. It takes hundreds of millions of dollars to become a senator. And it literally takes billions of dollars to become president of the United States. And then you have someone like Bernie Sanders, who really challenged the status quo, even though he was running in the Democratic Party primaries, and inspired many, many people, millions of people, who continued to support him in his second run. And you saw basically a conspiracy of the other Democratic Party candidates, the establishment of one of these two pillars of the system, which uh, made sure that he did not get the nomination. And at that moment, before Super Tuesday, the Democrats were willing to have the possibility that Trump could win rather than someone like Bernie Sanders who would raise the expectations of people who want health care and all the neat p things that people need for their lives. I think that the elections uh, promote ignorance. Certainly there's the issue of media access. This should be opened up for people to have access. But then you vote for someone who promises peace and carries out war. The politicians who get elected are not beholden to the people in any way, shape, or form. That's the problem with the system and why the only true democracy will be when the people have the power, not only economically, but from economic power comes true political power and democracy for the vast majority of people. In fact, all the people win the majority, the working class, rules. Thank you, Gloria. I want an extension? Please. I'll take my minute because uh, this idea of being able to win uh, within these parties, uh, I had the West Virginia uh, Republican primary won in 2018, and what I learned from that was that the establishment as someone mentioned earlier, is very, the Democratic Republican parties are very well connected. Uh, Fox, MSNBC, CNN, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Washington Times, and about every network or newspaper in the United States that you can name called me a felon over a hundred times in the last seven days before the election when I took the lead. Uh, it's unbelievable how they will come together and use uh, weaponized defamation. It, uh, Nancy Pelosi describes it as a wrap-up smear. They leak a little rumor to the uh, to the media, and then they, when the media begins to report on what they leaked to the media, then the media uh, telling that story verifies what they've leaked to them. So they tell the media you're a felon, the media says you're a felon, the public believes you're a felon, and you can't win. Thank you, Don. So we're going to keep diving a little deeper on uh, this question. I met uh, this gentleman, Sean Stone, um, I don't know, a long time ago, sat down with him and Jesse Ventura's son, Tyrell, and, and learned a lot about the topic he's about to discuss here. So 
Uh, Sean uh, does a show called Buzzsaw, and uh, you may be familiar with his father, Oliver Stone, as well, and really a conscious independent media voice and producer. So we're very glad to have Sean be a part of this. So uh, Sean Stone, it's the question, and Howie, you'll be the first to answer. Hi, my name is Sean Stone. You might know me as the former host of Buzzsaw, as well as watching the Hawks for RT. Currently, I host a podcast called Interviews on Vocal Now. I've also directed some films and documentaries, including uh, Metahuman with Deepak Chopra, Century of War, and Hollywood DC, as well as the author of the book, New World's Water. So I'd like to ask the presidential candidates, this past year, We've seen the, uh, one of the district courts, the uh, federal district courts, actually rule that the NSA bulk collection of telephone data on Americans was illegal, essentially validating uh, what Snowden had leaked back in 2013 time period. And yet, uh, despite this admission from the federal courts, we still have not seen the full extent of NSA as well as uh, other three other agencies surveillance of Americans, including our emails and working in conjunction with private uh, phone companies to collect things around our uh, cell phone data and information. So my question becomes, what would you as president do to elucidate uh, not only the network of surveillance that's going against Americans that could be considered unconstitutional, uh, but more importantly, how to address this problem of surveillance in the modern age where uh, there are potentially rules for uh, tracking terrorism and other potential threats to American citizens at the same time protecting our constitutional rights. How do you walk that very thin and narrow line? Howie. Well, what I would do if I was president, is I would drop the charges on Edward Snowden and invite him into my administration. His book, Permanent Record, was the most compelling book I read last year. And his values are he's pro-democracy and against authoritarianism. And he believes there's legitimate intelligence collection, but it shouldn't violate our First and Fourth Amendment rights. And that's the kind of man I would need, because I'm not a techie. He has been his whole life. And he's got the right values. So I would draw guidance from him on how to end the surveillance state, but also be able to collect the intelligence we ought to have, like this coronavirus. You know, it was coming. Intelligence knew about it. And, uh, you know, Trump wasn't paying attention. But so I would, I would bring him. And while I was at it, I would drop the charges on Julian Assange, who's being persecuted for being a publisher of the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs. And that's the information we needed. The New York Times, Washington Post relied on what he released. And it's really a shame that they're silent. It's really a shame that both Biden and Trump are persecuting Julian Assange, so he should be freed. We have political prisoners and whistleblowers that should be freed. And so I think the first thing the president needs to do is say, no more surveillance state. The last thing I would say is, we need a new church committee like we had back in the 70s that exposed a lot of the kind of secret police state stuff that goes on. And Congress needs to take back its power. And if I was president, I'd invite them to. This imperial presidency has been in both administrations. And now with Donald Trump, we can see what a disaster it is. So uh, I think part of it, Congress got to step up and find out what the hell the government's been up to. And then when whistleblowers leak the documents, protect the whistleblowers, don't throw them in jail. We got at least a dozen who have, you know, are in jail for legitimate leaks. So, first day I'm in office, those people get their walking papers. They're going free. Thank you, Howie. And I just want to look at the camera and say, if we do a second debate, it would be a dream come true to have Edward Snowden uh, be a virtual co-moderator for us. So, on that, in that note, uh, Brian. Well, I'm going to agree with pretty much everything Howie said and add that not only are we talking about government surveillance, but companies like Amazon and Google so know, know so much about us, and uh, they're not afraid to use that and, and sell it to people and weaponize it against us. 
And I think we need to, first of all, break up those big companies and make sure that they are not uh, using that information in ways that, uh, that hurt us. Uh, we also have to face the fact that our entire news media is becoming more and more anemic. Uh, we, local newspapers are laying reporters off uh, and we have fewer and fewer people owning our news media and that's a dangerous to our whole society and to the whistleblowers uh, that we need. They don't have the places to go. Um, and so we need to do what we can, uh, maybe some public financing of news media to help them have a more robust local presence. Um, and I think we also have to have uh, protection for whistleblowers, uh, journalists against big corporations. Uh, a key case for me right now is the case of uh, David Daleiden in San Francisco, who has been reporting on the use of um, aborted fetal parts in medical uh, research at the University of San Francisco. And he's on trial. He's faced with, with a dozen, I think maybe it's down to nine uh, felonies now for doing basically what a news person is supposed to do if he went out and did research. Thank you, Brian. Brock. Well, surveillance should be constitutional or not happening at all. But I'd like to take a step back to technology in general. Technology might be the largest issue we face as a society right now. Look at the impact it's had on our democracy in terms of social networking. It's embarrassing when we see our tech leaders testify before our government. They don't even know what questions to ask. Technology, whether it be artificial intelligence, robotics, it's, you know, it's changing everything rapidly and we need visionary leadership that has their finger on the pulse. It matters. For example, the most precious commodity in the world used to be gold. Then it was oil. Guess what it is now? It's your data. Your data is the most important commodity in the world right now. It's being collected generally without your awareness or what you believe to be your consent. It's being sold. It's all over the place. You don't know where they collected it and where it is right now. And this is an example of where our government needed to be involved and protect us. The problem is you can't manage this through the rear view mirror. You have to have leadership with the foresight and the vision to navigate the difficult road ahead. Technology is amoral. It's neither good or bad. How we use it is what matters. It should be used as a tool to enhance our lives. I agree with the pardoning of Edward Snowden, Judy, Julian Assange, and making sure that we're protecting against uh, protecting whistleblowers that stand up for doing the right thing. Edward Snowden exhausted all of the channels he could. He did everything he could to do things in the right fashion. And when there was not any other way to do it, he put himself into harm's way for our benefit. And so technology matters and we need to get a handle on it. How are you going to get uh, your, how are you going to get your digital DNA back? And I believe this is a responsibility of our government and we need leadership that understands how to do that and so that we don't find ourselves in this circumstance or situation over again. Watch on Netflix this movie called The Social Dilemma and The Great Help. Thank you, Brock. I just saw a fly going by you. Better watch out <laughs> for the so, vice presidential so debate. <laughs> watch out there. <laughs> Couldn't help but laugh a little. All right, Gloria, please. <laughs> well, I completely agree with ending the persecution of Julian Assange and Edward Snowden. They carried out heroic acts in trying to let the people know about, in the case of Assange, U.S. war crimes. And of course, that's why Chelsea Manning was sentenced to 35 years, and because of the popular support for her, she was uh, given uh, clemency by President Trump. But then she continued to be um, persecuted by being put in jail for refusing to testify in a grand jury that would have affected Julian Assange. And, but it, it points to, it's one aspect of the military state of the United States, the police and military, the surveillance apparatus against the working class, against the people of the U.S., that the people of the U.S. and the world, every phone call is documented, every phone call is listened to live. 
And that's the apparatus of the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, and so many other police agencies whose role is to keep the economic power, the political power, the military power for the US ruling class, for US imperialism. That's the root problem. So we can talk about dismantling them. We can talk about laws to protect people. We can talk about ending uh, unlimited surveillance. But the real problem is overturning this system of capital that has killed millions since World War II, that plans more war wars, that is using these extremely f sophisticated uh, surveillance planes that are flying over Venezuela, flying over Cuba, flying near China, trying to find a way to find the weak spots, to uh, carrying out continual war exercises against North Korea for the intent of future war. War against China, war against Russia. It is a dangerous, dangerous system that we are experiencing. And the people are, of the US are also victims. The, by the way, I want to also point out that there's increased attacks on journalists. They must be allowed to report on what has taken place in the streets of the U.S. Thank you, Gloria. Don. I, mean, I think the key thing to, to remember when you're talking about surveillance is uh, the human nature hasn't changed much since they wrote the Constitution, but technology has changed a lot. Uh, but the bottom line is that the rules of searching seizing people's property and so forth are still the same. Uh, illegal search and seizure is not allowed. And uh, it's very simple. There should be no surveillance uh, by the U.S. government without a warrant and good cause. And there should be no surveillance at all by Google or Facebook or Microsoft or Apple or anyone else. So basically the law ought to, ought to mirror the Constitution. Uh, you cannot search or seize people's property, whether it be their data, or whether it be uh, the goods in their house without, uh, without a warrant. And uh, that hasn't changed. We just need to enforce uh, the Constitution, make the laws consistent with the Constitution. And uh, unless, we, uh, unless someone can convince uh, you know, enough people to amend the Constitution, then all this surveillance has to end. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Please, Gloria. To bring up a very important case here in Denver, Colorado, talking about surveillance and illegal search and seizure, which I agree we must oppose. And that is several Denver peace activists who were protesting for months, leading mass peaceful marches against the killing of Elijah McLean, a young 23-year-old black man. And they were rounded up three weeks ago today, brutally arrested threatened, surveilled for days and days, in which the DA refused to charge the police who murdered Elijah McClain and instead used that uh, power that they have to arrest some of my comrades and other activists who were held in isolation for nine days. And there is a massive movement being built for them. That's part of the surveillance that the police use against peaceful activists. And that repression is growing from Denver to Portland, to other cities as well. And I think we have to understand they are threatening our rights to protest. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on uh, to our next question. Uh, we'll start with Brian to answer on this one. And we're rolling right into technology. Nice flow there. And so the gentleman here, uh, Jim Cantrell, uh, he's actually a co-founder of SpaceX. I've learned a lot about him, about decentralization and CubeSats and space. And uh, I thought this question, uh, I'm really glad he, he's bringing this to the debate. So Jim Cantrell, co-founder of SpaceX. Hi, my name is Jim Cantrell. I'm an entrepreneur in the aerospace industry and have uh, worked with the uh, U.S. military and space activities for the majority of my career. My question for you is regarding the space development agency that uh, President Trump initiated about three years ago. This uh, space development agency, or space force as it's been called, was a controversial decision and uh, there were some people that supported it, some that didn't, myself included. My question for you is, do you support the space development agency and would you back it as president? Secondly, do you think it sends the right message to our adversaries and other nations in space that we intend to uh, 
preserve peace in space or that we intend to uh, conduct war in space. Third question is, uh, do you think that uh, it's likely that any other nation will ever attack our assets in space? And then the fourth question is, if so, do you consider that an act of war worthy of going to war against such a nation? Thank you. All right. That's a lot to take in. Yeah. I, yeah. I think I only got three of the four questions written and down. That's okay. Did everybody get the questions? It's very hard to hear. Yeah. Right. So that happens. Uh, um, first we, of all, okay. yeah, first of all, he's asking Wait, if, mm -hmm. if he's asking if, uh, if I predict that uh, nations will uh, attack our stuff in space. And uh, I'm not a prophet, you know, but every time through history, when something like this has come along, nations have fought over it. So it's, it's reasonable to assume that uh, if we put something out there, other countries will attack it. Uh, we have throughout history seen arms races. Uh, World War I was largely caused by an arms race. Uh, the, the Germans and the English and the French and the Russians were all building up armaments and they all felt like they had to build more uh, to keep up with the, the neighboring country and what they were doing. And it led to a horrible, horrible war. And I think if we militarize space, we can expect it will lead to warfare. We'll put something out there and the other countries will feel that for their own security, they have to destroy it. And it will lead to uh, very widespread war. And so I would like to see some kind of an international board that could control uh, what goes out there. We shouldn't have any weapons out there that haven't been, well, we shouldn't have any weapons out there, but if we don't have some kind of an international board that, uh, that would be in charge of approving that kind of thing, it's gonna happen. There's no way it's gonna, gonna be kept from happening. And, uh, we don't want that to happen, and so we need to work with other countries in the world to make rules that prevent uh, weapons from being sent out there. Thank you, Brian. I apologize for the sound there, and I hope all the candidates could hear that. Uh, let me know. Um, uh, Brock, please. Uh, thank you, Jim Cantrell, for uh, the excellent questions on space. The first of which is, do I support the development of this new space agency? I do. I do support it knowing that we are in a space race vis-a-vis -vis Russia and China in particular. I also know that if this becomes a game of our traditional conquest and our colonialization and conflict in space, it could lead to horrific things for all of humanity, which means we have to find a peaceful resolution, a peaceful treaty to share space. But to bring other parties to the table, I think it's important that we have that first mover advantage. And we have very real issues. The threat of uh, a potential asteroid. With all the satellites being split in space, what are the policies by which we allow them to get there? When those things crash and create debris, that creates very real issues for us. And so we're going to need to develop something. Um, I don't want to compare to the United Nations. I, I want to compare something more to the Federation from, from Star Trek. Uh, but whatever it is, we're going to have to find some sort of treaty to work together in space. Uh, we know at this point, whether it be our nuclear pro proliferation treaties in the U.S., I mean, excuse me, on, on planet Earth, we need these types of things, and they're going to be even more important as we enter the space age. The last question, I think, was if our assets in space were attacked, would this be a cause for war? God, please help us that this does not happen. And I think one of uh, your earlier questions is, do we have weapons in space? And we do already. Um, they're known as the rods of God. Thank you. Gloria. I don't think that any space agency created by the U.S. government has any peaceful purposes, um, purely militaristic. The U.S., remember, reserves the right to use nuclear weapons as a first strike against countries that don't even have nuclear weapons. And more and more weapons are being produced. The, they talk about 760, 780 
billion dollar military budget, but it's more like a trillion dollars because nuclear weapons are not in the defense budget. They're in the Department of Energy. And why do we need a trillion dollars of weapons every year? Uh, and the occupation of dozens and dozens of countries. Um, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, the U.S. is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. And we continue to see that. Dozens of coups, dozens of wars, dozens of occupation, sanctions which murder people. And we cannot forget also the U.S. financing, arming Saudi Arabia's brutal genocidal war against the people of Yemen. China and Russia are not a threat to the United States. And we just have to extrapolate what the US is doing in terms of space and presenting it as something peaceful. Look what the US is doing in the matter of COVID. They're blockading Ch Cuba, which has been doing remarkable work. There's a fly flying around. Remarkable work in terms of fighting the COVID virus, working with other countries. The US is trying to kill countries that are being successful on the issue of fighting COVID. And uh, they're doing the same with China, demonizing China for the purposes of future aggression. It's called the pivot to Asia that Obama first announced and has been continued and is promised not only by Trump, but by Biden as well. The US is the real war danger. And I would definitely not be for a space agency under this current system. Thank you. Don. Yeah, I think that I would be in full support of you know, a uh, very robust effort to continue to develop in space. Uh, I think you have to be. Uh, the alternative to the United States having the uh, stronger position and the better technology in space is that someone else will have it. I think despite all of our flaws in this country that I would rather uh, that strength be in this country than in many, any, any other country. Uh, if someone attacks United States assets in space or anywhere else, uh, I think it's an act of war. Uh, of course, whether you would go to war or not would depend on the nature of it, who did it, why they did it, and a whole host of things that we don't know. But generally speaking, space exploration has brought a lot of technology to us, and it's, uh, it's implausible to, uh, to say that we wouldn't have a space agency if we had not had one for all these years, we would certainly be way behind in a lot of a lot of technological areas. So, generally speaking, I think that uh, the important thing to remember is that uh, the world has benefited a great deal from American uh, superiority in many areas, including nuclear weapons and so forth. In the hands of the wrong people, uh, the devastation would be uh, unimaginable. So uh, I'm very much in favor of the United States maintaining its lead, and that's actually my biggest concern, that the country is deteriorating so badly financially, morally, and in every other respect that uh, we will not maintain the position where we can make sure that the world remains peaceful and more prosperous. Mm. Thank you. Howie? Well, we should continue scientific inquiry in space through NASA like we've done. The problem now is not just militarization with a space force, which should be dismantled, but privatization. And this is such a big enterprise. It's a natural monopoly. And it shouldn't just be something the United States does. It should be done with international cooperation. The problem is our foreign and military policy is about dominating the world. They call it full spectrum dominance. Air, land, and sea, now they've added space and cyberspace. And that's not how to build peace and security in the world. That's how to protect US-based banks and corporations exploit the rest of the world. So we need a new whole orientation to our foreign and military policy. And space should not be militarized. It should be in the public sector. And there are things we need to start working on in common. Like, there's a lot of waste up in space. It's becoming dangerous for the satellites and other vehicles that are up there. How are we going to get rid of that? Who's responsible? So, that's the kind of thing we can do with international cooperation. And if somebody does take out our assets in space, war is not the only answer, probably the worst answer. Because with all these nuclear weapons around, you know, that could be the end of us. You can, we, through international institutions, find out who did it and how are they going to make up for it. Reparations. And build world public opinion around that. I mean, that's an option to saying, oh, you know, let's have a Star Wars. 
You know, that's, that's not the future, or we won't have a future if we go down that path. All right, well, thank you. We're going to move on to our next question. Uh, a gentleman uh, met at Red Rocks Amphitheater uh, on stage, a sold-out crowd, and he did a beautiful dance in his Lakota um, attire. And uh, this gentleman has been a key of wisdom, wisdom and mentor for quite a few years of, of mine. And uh, he actually sparked, was one of the sparks, the creators of Standing Rock, and taught me that what set that apart is that it came from a place of prayer. And so he actually uh, led our United We Stand today, we had earlier today, um, from a place of prayer, one of our first speakers uh, with his Lakota message. And so he has a question for you today. Uh, Doug Goodfeather. Oh, Chante Waste Yuha Chichapi, Wiaka Waste Milo. Hello, my name is Doug Goodfeather, and I come to you in a good way today, not only as an indigenous man, but as an American and a veteran. And these are the, one, these are the questions I want to ask. Is, are you going to give us jurisdictional rights in our sovereign nations so that we can prosecute criminals who come onto our sovereign land and commit crimes? We need to address the education. Are you going to address this education and how are you going to resolve these issues? Healthcare system, economic growth and stability and addictions. How are you going to come to uh, the table and create solutions for our sovereign people, our indigenous people? As well as having seats at the table in, in the Congress and the Senate and every tribal nation throughout this country, we need people to be sitting there as delegates for this great nation so that we can represent who we are and because we deserve a right, we deserve a voice, we deserve to be heard. So that's why we're standing here and we're, we're asking, we're, we need you to answer these questions in a good way. Thank you very much. Hmm. I, got, I have goosebumps. Oh. Oh. All right, so Brock, please. <laughs> uh, Doug Goodfeather. Hmm. Thank you. My Lakota name is Wakia. I've been through naming ceremonies, and as part of my campaign trail, I've been at Standing Rock presenting to the Tribal Council, and I will be back through there again shortly. I care deeply about the indigenous rights of the First Nation in this country. We have racial division in this nation. And the process to begin that healing starts with the acknowledgement of the past. What we've been taught is a lie. History is his story as written by the victors. And this story begins in 1493 with the doctrine of discovery and the papal bull. I live in Puerto Rico and so I'm very familiar with this story and the impact that the conquistadors and the colonialists have had on the indigenous people in the Caribbean, Central and South and North America, and eventually on the Africans that were brought here without their consent. And it starts with acknowledging the past and making sure that everyone has a seat at the table so we can find a path forward together in a good way. To answer your question about education, we need an effective education for everyone. My heart breaks for an entire generation of kids right now that are not receiving the effective education they need. And so I will be returning to the Dakota Lakota region of South Dakota and North Dakota in the next couple of weeks. And I would love to connect with you there to further this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Gloria. Yes, thank you so much, Doug, for the questions and your comments. I agree very much with you. Jurisdictional rights for Native nations must be respected and restored. There was a Native man recently executed in federal prison, one of a stream of executions that the federal government under Attorney General Barr and President Trump has been sped up uh, more than in, in decades. And that was a violation of the nation that he was from. They protested this, but to no avail. We must respect Native treaties, each one that has been violated by the U.S. government. From the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, that was basically half of South Dakota. And instead, several years later after the signing of that treaty, the Black Hills, which 
the discovery of gold and other rich minerals uh, in the great Sioux Nation land was taken away. And to this very day, the extraction of gold and now the fracking and liquefying of uranium there, while next door, Pine Ridge Reservation has an average income of $2,600 to $3,500 a year. That's the effect of genocide and the continued war on Native people. I want to point out Leonard Peltier, great Native warrior, is in prison 44 and a half years. He must be freed. We call on President Trump to give him clemency now. And whoever wins the next election, if, he's, if he doesn't, the next president must be pressured to free Leonard Peltier, who was fighting for the protection of Pine Ridge, the people on Pine Ridge. The CARES Act only provided $1 billion for all the Indian health centers of the country. That is a sham, while trillions was given to the banks and Wall Street within days. There must be um, the return of the Black Hills and much of land that has been stolen, including uh, there needs to be the shepherding of what is federal land really taken from native land of Bears Ears to the land in Arizona and so on. And I'll stop. My time's up. Thank you. Don? Yeah, obviously, no uh, person in the United States has been treated worse than the American Indian was treated uh, from the time that the uh, white settlers came to the country. And uh, it's unfortunate that we have that in our history. And of course, uh, the land, the jurisdiction, the, the rights of the uh, indigenous people of this, uh, this continent need to be respected. Uh, I don't know a lot of the details, of course, uh, in the area of the country where I'm from, the, the March of the Trail of Tears and so forth are very sad stories, but as children we were not focused on that uh, in our history lessons and did not really consider it to be what it was, you know, a, a genocide basically. So I would be in favor of uh, learning more about what it is that uh, the American Indian uh, nations and communities need and uh, taking whatever initiative is necessary to address those problems. Uh, it's a, again, it's really sad that we have that in our history, but it is there, and all we can do at this point is to, to try to make things right going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Howie. Yeah, Native nations should have jurisdiction on their own territory, not just on criminal justice, but on environmental justice. You know, the Keystone Pipeline was one thing. Now we got the expansion of these Enbridge lines across Indian lands in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Michigan. And that's bringing Alberta, Alberta tar sands oil and fracked oil from the Bakken fields to refineries. And the Native people are calling for their shutdown. Enbridge is expanding. And I think Native people in their own land should have jurisdiction. So that's number one. Number two is treaties have been violated. We need to honor the treaty rights. And a lot of that is giving back the land that the treaty said these indigenous nations were supposed to have and they've lost. You know, and that includes like Native Hawaiians. I got cousins in Hawaii. They have homelands that the Native Hawaiians are supposed to use and they keep saying, and this is the democratic machine that runs Hawaii, that land is too good for a resort. You can't have it now. This is, I mean, we thought the Indian Wars ended in the 19th century. No, they're still going on. And then, as far as delivering education, health care, and economic development, treaties provide for a lot of that. They've been violated. We need to provide that. And then we need to make sure everybody, Native people and non-Native people, have their basic economic rights when we talk about an economic bill of rights and a Green New Deal to rebuild the economy so it's sustainable. And finally, seats at the table, we need proportional representation, ranked choice voting for multi-member districts, for Congress right down to city councils. Now we'll give Native people their fair shot. But also, we might consider what they do in New Zealand, where the indigenous Maori people have certain seats set aside that they elect to their national parliament. And maybe that's what we need to do in this country. So Native people, the original inhabitants, have their share, fair share of representation and power in Washington. Thank you. Um, Brian. Well, obviously, the 
issue that's in front of everything is how many treaties that we have broken and violated. Uh, and in, in the process, we have stolen so much from the, from the Native Americans. Um, and Leviticus 6 says, when you discover that you have done something to shortchange somebody, you make good and then an extra 20% on top of that. And I don't think we're locked into a uh, formula there, but the principle is there. Uh, we have to do what we can to make up for what we have uh, shortchanged and stolen. I think as far as uh, seat at the table, uh, this would be one area where I would look favorably upon gerrymandering so that various Native American lands could be uh, formulated into making sure that uh, in, in states that have a high Native American population, uh, we have at least a congressional district or maybe two or three in some of them uh, that would be representative of Native peoples. Uh, I am also a strong believer uh, in uh, bilingual education. Uh, a culture is passed along in its language. And when we take a language away from people like we have done with so many of the native peoples, the culture is lost. And so we need to do what we can. The question's going to be about police reform. As a result of police brutality, we have seen protests across the nation calling for police reform. What steps would you take to reform law enforcement? Don. Well, first of all, uh, I wouldn't defund the police. I think it would be a horrible mistake to defund the police in the face of the violence that we're seeing. I, I will point out that there is not a great deal of commonality between the atrocities of the white officers or police officers killing blacks and the situation that existed. Uh, the, six to, the situation uh, in Louisville uh, with Breonna Taylor was basically a violation of the Constitution. Uh, a uh, search warrant, uh, a no-knock search warrant, was uh, issued in violation of uh, there being a reasonable need for a search. And for that search to occur at night, and police officers to be directed uh, to go to the home when the person had never committed a crime and the person who they suspected of having committed a crime was not there uh, is ridiculous. So I would point out again that there are many protections in the Constitution that help. As far as police reform, it's obvious that there are bad actors in police departments and that there's not enough training about uh, being civil, uh, you know, outlawing chokeholds is a very simple thing and should be stopped. Uh, but at the same time, when prosecutors and chief of police and others are instructing police officers to do things that put both them and whoever it is that they're uh, seeking to arrest at risk, uh, we got to go back to that as well. It's not proper to just point our finger at the police or the policeman or the police department but rather at the system which uh, needs to be reviewed and we need to be uh, in compliance with the Constitution and in compliance with common sense. Thank you. Howie? Well, the emphasis right now is demanding use of force reforms. And that's not enough. We had a law in New York City against using a chokehold. And 20 years later, Eric Garner was choked to death by police who have not been punished yet. So what we need is community control of the police. Not these review boards appointed by the politicians that set up the police forces we got to do what they do, but either commissions elected by the public or selected by lot like juries with the power to hire and fire the police chiefs, rid the forces of the racists and the sadists, oversee budgets and policies, and independently investigate and discipline officers for misconduct. As long as the police police themselves are going to get away with these crimes, the assaults, the murders, and rackets like civil asset forfeiture. That's number one. Number two, the roots of mass incarceration is the war on drugs. Marijuana should be legal. It's less harmful than alcohol and tobacco. We should tax and regulate it like we do those drugs. And in the hard drugs, instead of making them criminal charges, it should be appearance tickets. 
and you go like they do in Portugal before a doctor, a social worker, and a lawyer, and they look at your situation and see how they might could help. And in Portugal, that means they don't have drug overdoses. They don't have HIV spread. They don't have street-related drug crime. And actually, less people use these hard drugs. That's the approach we need to take. And then finally, defunding the police, man. You take all the money from the police department, it won't be enough to solve the problems that we ask the police to do that they're not equipped to do. A homeless person doesn't need a vagrancy charge. They need a home. An addict doesn't need a criminal charge for possessing a drug. They need drug treatment. A mental, person with a mental health crisis needs help, not a cop with a gun who doesn't know how to deal with that. So, but the problem is there are not enough money in the police department to provide those services. That means we've got to demilitarize or reprioritize spending we're putting into the military and put it into the cities. Housing, homes, uh, schools, health care, jobs, and provide these racially oppressed communities that have been segregated, discriminated against, and exploited for generations with what they need to be whole and prosperous. Brian. Yeah, I'm going to agree, especially with a lot of what Howie has just said about demilitarizing our police and moving some of our military budget into uh, healthier communities uh, where we're not our, you know, our school to prison pipeline is interrupted and we are working to build people rather than incarcerate people. Uh, I don't believe that the idea of just you know, defunding the police as, it's, as it sounds by the words uh, is appropriate. We have to have um, teams of people working in our communities, uh, health workers, uh, psychologists uh, working. The most dangerous thing a policeman can do is go into a uh, domestic dispute. And uh, so we need a different kind of approach to that. Uh, to de-escalize, oftentimes when police show up, it escalates the situation. And we need to put people trained uh, in those kinds of situations uh, into the situation where they can de-escalate and uh, we need better protection uh, and encouragement of police to watch out for each other, uh, where good officers know who the bad officers are, um, but unions or whatever are preventing them from uh, reporting them. We need to be put in protection so that uh, the officers can police themselves and get rid of those officers who are responsible for most of the problems, a small group of officers. And uh, we need to make sure that uh, when there are situations like happened in Tennessee, um, that we were protecting our population from the police. I'm from Minnesota. And so I've been to the George Floyd memorial as part of this campaign. And so I believe in law and order, first of all. I think it's the foundation of a well-functioning society. But uh, we clearly have a problem. This is not an isolated incident. This has been happening over and over and over again. I think the answer is different training, better training, continual training, and evaluation, along with changing in policy, perhaps even in pay, and clearly having to be able to you got to get the bad cops off the, uh, you know, get rid of the bad cops. Demilitarize the police. Um, probably a good idea to have police officers work in the uh, neighborhoods in which they live rather than traveling. I think, though, beyond this, we need to end um, private prisons. I think that we need to end the war on drugs. Uh, I'd like to work with organizations like the Innocent Project, to pardon wrongfully convicted um, people, such as Leonard Peltier. Um, I think I uh, it would immediately pardon everybody uh, in jail for nonviolent cannabis uh, related crimes, but I think it comes back to incentives. Our founders had a very powerful intention for this country, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We've been measuring our success as a people, as a government, by growth. 
The problem with growth is it doesn't differentiate between good and bad growth. You know, cops arrest more people to get a bigger budget, to hire more cops to arrest more people to get a bigger budget. We have a misalignment of incentives. What if we started to measure our success as a nation by life, but specifically liberty? We're supposed to be the land of the free. What if we started to measure our success by our freedom, by our liberty? Policy would change. Everything would start to change if that's how we held our government to account. We have more people in prison, more people locked up, per capita and in totality than any other country in the world. And that has to change. Gloria. I'd like to first recommend that the listeners and viewers uh, take a look at our newspaper issue that is called How to Abolish the Police. And it is on liberationnews.org. It's an excellent, well thought out and lengthy description of how we view um, the issue of defunding the police, abolishing the police, how to fight police terror. I fully support the demand of defunding the police in all its ramifications. And it is only this mass movement, the uprising, after the execution, this horrific murder of George Floyd, where he was pleading with his, for his life, that has shaken some of the roots of this country. But to really understand how to change this police terror, we have to understand the foundation of the United States. The genocidal character of the brutal system of chattel slavery, genocide against Native people, the enormous wealth that was created, and even after the end of slavery became all these institutions that arose to keep the power of the capitalists, the wealth again that was created from enslaved labor, the police, the slave catchers, the police, the prisons, and why there are so many black people in prison. Also by the justice system, all the laws that were heaped upon the people from the 1980s by zealous politicians. Uh, we have to greatly reduce the prison population, but again, the police role under capitalism is to maintain the power, to keep the people down, to evict a tenant who can't pay the rent. That's the role of the sheriffs. It is a very repressive system, and when, when, I, when I talk about the roots of our, of our police system and chattel slavery, compare police brutality in the U.S. to Britain and Germany. Not even a handful of people have been killed by police guns in those countries. We have to uproot systemic racism by uprooting the system. All right, so we'll be uh, moving on to our next question. Howie, with COVID-19, we've seen education reformed using homeschooling, virtual classrooms, and options for in-school education. What steps would you take to reform America's broken educational system? Well, first we got to get the kids back in the schools we got. I mean, Donald Trump is like the typhoid Mary of COVID. And now the chickens have come home to roost. All the people around him are sick. And this guy, we're 4% of the world's population. We got 25% of the world's deaths from this. 25% of the world's infections. It's been a total failure. So the first thing we need to do is scale up testing, contact tracing, and isolating those people who are exposed and affected so we can suppress community spread of the virus. And then people can go back to work and school safely. The idea that we can like live the way we've been living and kids are supposed to be at home online, man, a lot of people don't have online. We got a digital divide and we can't even get a COVID relief package through Congress to provide relief for that and a whole lot of other things that people need. So the first thing we got to do is suppress the virus like they've done throughout the Pacific Rim from South Korea to New Zealand and in Europe, and in many African and Southeast Asian countries. And we can't do it. I mean, the two governing parties in this country are presiding over a failed state. So the kids can't go back to school. That's where we're at. So that's the first thing. Education reform. We should have federal funding of public schools instead of relying on the local property tax, which is unequally distributed. Give every school uh, district per capita funding and then with some supplemental funding for schools 
districts that, and schools that have been historically under-resourced and need help to catch up. Uh, we got to end this high-stakes testing and uh, privatization with charter schools. Support the public schools. Don't waste money on private schools, which are a bunch of scams anyway. I mean, it's unbelievable how many of those charter schools have ended up being the people going to jail or walking away with the money. And I can't give you the whole program in two minutes, but first thing is to suppress the virus so the kids can go back to school. Brian? I will disagree with Howie on uh, charter schools. Uh, I spent 40 years in education. I taught in both private schools and public schools. Uh, and I believe that public schools are the most important thing for most students. Uh, it is the opportunity for people to move uh, up in social class through education. But I also believe that some charter schools, not all of them, I do not believe in for-profit uh, private schools. I think a lot of them are scams, as Howie said. But there's a lot of them that are very creative, and they are designed for a specific population of students that are at risk for a variety of reasons and many of them can be very effective. I also believe that home schools can be very effective in training students, uh, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, I agree with him that we need to get rid of the high stakes testing. Uh, I agree with him that we need to have local control, but even out funding on a national basis. Uh, we need to end the digital divide. I taught for most of my career in a very poor district uh, that had no tax base. And as a result, it had none of the blessings that the neighboring school districts had. And that's a crime. We need to make sure that every child in America has an equal opportunity uh, for a good education. Uh, but it may come from a variety of different uh, sources and, and delivery systems. And when we have local control, then we are going to have people trying different things and we could see what works. The, running the whole thing from Washington is a failure. Brock. The youth are the future of this nation. We need an effective education for everyone. Now how we get there, I do support charter options because I support the idea of choice. I believe in giving American families as much choice as possible. I also have an issue with what we're teaching. I support our teachers, but I feel our education system in many respects is more a system of indoctrination. And I think that our curriculum is in need of improvements. A lot of the most basic things that you need to live your life are not being taught. Things like financial literacy, something that you know you're going to need, but we're not equipping the youth today with those skills. And many parents are not equipped to teach these things. This is where the education system has so much potential. The digital divide, this is very real. If you recreated Maslow's hierarchy of needs today, you know, access to financial tools, access to a computer or a phone, a connection. These things are essential to be able to thrive in the world we live in. Um, teaching kids to code, uh, conflict resolution, you know, just some basic psychological stuff would benefit all of us. And I don't mean just the kids. I mean the big kids too, myself to some extent, right? I do agree that giving uh, uh, authority to the local um, uh, uh, distributing uh, those decisions as much as powerful as possible away from places like Washington, D.C. is a great thing. And my heart is broken. My heart is broken for all the kids in this country right now. We have to get them back in school. The damage being done to an entire generation of kids, the trauma that is going to be with them for the rest of the lives and their lives and the healing that not only they are going to need, but all of us as Americans, we have real mental health issues and we have to find a way to heal and move forward. Thank you. Gloria. To resolve the crisis for the children in this pandemic, we have to resolve the crisis of the pandemic itself. 
and Trump is criminally guilty of not only neglect, but deliberately knowing that what his failure to enact the policies that were needed to save lives killed 212,000 people now. When you have a country like Cuba that had 120 deaths so far because of a national plan, you can see how horrible it is that so many people have died and their families have suffered. The children at this point need to stay home if their schools are not safe, but we shouldn't leave it at that. What happens when the kids stay home and the parents have to go to work? There's no childcare. We need a massive childcare provided for all the families. That should be a guaranteed right anyway, constitutional right. I believe that the Defense Production Act that was first mentioned in this crisis should be fully implemented. If I were president or a president who really cared about the people, who wasn't a capitalist, would use the Defense Production Act, which was created in 1950, to create genocide against the Korean people, instead would harness the means of production, the factories, the great productive capacity of the country to build thousands of schools that are needed. They're already decrepit, full of asbestos, crowded classrooms. They need to be greatly expanded, and in the rural areas especially, so that kids can have a safe environment. Um, they can go back to school if it's safe for them, but they're not right now. Uh, give the teachers an increase in their income and stop making them have to pay for the things that children need in classrooms out of their pay. Free education. Encourage through free education the right of all the youth to become teachers and to increase the right of the children. I'm against charter schools, um, and we need food for the school kids. That's one thing. Kids are going hungry. Families are going hungry. Don. And you prefaced your last question with a statement about COVID-19. I think one thing that's important to understand is you can't manage what you don't measure. And the COVID-19 crisis, if you will, or pandemic has not been properly measured. Uh, it may surprise many listeners out there that the CDC uh, reports that we've had fewer deaths in this country from disease this year uh, by, a great, by nearly 200,000 than we had last year. Yet there are 200,000 COVID deaths that have been reported. There have not been 200,000 COVID deaths because uh, a typical change in the CDC reported deaths would be 1% or less than 1% year over year, and this year the, the death rate is actually way down. Uh, part of that, admittedly, is part of the focus on COVID, the mask, a whole host of things. But the bottom line is that there, are all, that there has been as large an increase in uh, uh, respiratory deaths and other uh, pneumonia and so forth, as big a decrease as, had, as there has been in an increase in, uh, that's represented by COVID. Having said that, uh, what I think about the education system is made pretty clear by the fact that all five of my grandkids are being homeschooled. Uh, the Department of Energy, like so many departments in D.C., uh, is a waste. Uh, Common Core is a horrible mistake. Uh, our kids are not being properly educated. We're following, you know, the fact that we spend more money than most nations per pupil and we're, we're ranked probably 30 in the, in the world as opposed to number one. The disparity in testing scores by race is uh, damaging. It's, uh, it uh, dis disincentivizes people, discourages people, makes them think the system's unfair. Uh, education, uh, you know, by teachers that are unionized and are more focused on themselves than they are on the pupils is a major problem. And I could go on and on, but I'll end there with the fact that the education system in the United States is broken like many of its other systems. Thank you. All right, so moving on to our next question. Brian. The UN has called the world's largest human, humanitarian catastrophe, including starvation, genocide, and desperately needs humanitarian, humanitarian uh, aid, that is. What role should the United States play in Yemen? So it's about the genocide in Yemen. Could you repeat that? Yes, the UN has called the world's largest humanitarian catastrophe, including starvation, genocide, and desperately needs humanitarian aid. 
what role should the U.S. play in Yemen? Oh, in Yemen, okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, we are, have to admit that we're largely responsible for that. We sold enormous numbers of weapons to the Saudis, uh, and that has led to the, to the problem. And we need to, first of all, uh, hold the Saudis responsible for much of what's going on in there. We, we have made them our friends in the region, uh, and I'm not saying we need to be enemies, but we need to hold uh, Saudi Arabia to a higher standard than we have. Uh, you know, they murder journalists and they do all kinds of stuff, and we continue to give them large numbers of weapons, and it's the weapons that have caused a large part of the problem in Yemen. Uh, and so we need to work to insert uh, humanitarian aid there. But the first thing is we need to stop dropping our bombs on them. And as long as we are, you know, horrible things, where, where our missiles are hitting school buses of kids going on field trips, uh, that's, that's a horrible crime. And we cannot continue. And we need to use all of our influence uh, to try and bring peace in that region. And we can't bring peace when we are th the major arms supplier. It's just not going to work. Brock. Ooh, how do we deal with these humanitarian crises while well, we're in the midst of one ourselves? You know, this is one of the major ripple effects of this economic shutdown. Uh, the World Food Program, I think, published data that said 132 million new People in the developing world are at risk of starvation because of the impact on the supply chain and food production. You know, there's these, these ripple effects are happening everywhere. And so uh, it, it's, I think we're going to see some very horrifying data uh, coming out over the course of the next year because things that we could usually do, we are not equipped to do. And um, I mean, yes, peace is the answer. How do we prevent these types of conflicts from happening in the first place? Uh, the refugee trend that is going to continue to increase throughout the world. How do we make things easier for refugees to get the aid, the support that they need, or to move to places where opportunities might exist for them? Uh, at a time where if you look at you know, potential environmental data, er, environmental data um, you know, there's a, there's a very real possibility in 50 to 100 years, many of us are going to be refugees. And so I think we have to have incredible compassion for people that are finding themselves in these situations. And I'm just, I'm just horrified by our inability to do the things that we could usually do because of the challenges that we have here at home. I think that we need to open up businesses that want to open up allow people that wish to work to go back to work and allow consumers to consume that wish to so that the world economy and the world supply chain can begin moving again so that we can actually address these things. In this environment, our hands are largely tied. Gloria. Yes, millions of Yemeni people, especially children and older people, are facing starvation. Many are starving today by the sanctions imposed by the U.S., the support of the U.S. for Saudi Arabia. And the U.S. continues to march on with its plans of dom total domination of the Middle East. They have uh, recently pressured UAE, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain to agree to accords that strengthen Israel's role as a police state for U.S. empire in the Middle East. What is the aim, the ultimate objective of the United States? It has been to destroy and dismantle every secular state in the Middle East, from Iraq, which provided for the people, I was there, and provided for the people by the control of its oil, nationalized oil. That country and government was destroyed. Iran, which is you know, a, a bulwark against US designs and why it is facing heavy, heavy sanctions. Um, and the war on Syria, which the U.S., uh, by its destruction of Libya under President Obama, by bombing that country, which was trying to unite the, people, uh, the peoples and nations of Africa for their own 
development and sovereignty. Gaddafi was murdered, a uh, pretext to do that. And then you found the flourishing of terrorist organizations that are backed by the United States. That's why Al-Qaeda and uh, the Islamic State were able to rise up was because of the US destruction of independent, secular, progressive states in the Middle East. The US marches on. And we must say, we must stop all US intervention, all US sanctions, and all US war threats on other peoples. Don. Uh, probably not surprising, my view is a little bit different. Uh, I don't think the United States government uh, has the authority, was not given the authority under the Constitution to be a humanitarian organization for people around the world. But having said that, so long as 600,000 Americans are sleeping on the street without a home, that's where the government's focus should be if they're going to do humanitarian things initially. We need to put poor Americans in homes and improve their life. That's the purpose of the United States government. Uh, it's, it's really unfortunate that uh, we have so many causes, like climate change, for example, that take away billions and billions of dollars. And billions of dollars have been wasted under the myth that four or five percent of the world's population can change the temperature of the earth. Uh, that's the kind of money that is, could go for the causes of helping humans today not uh, spending billions of dollars on the chance that we might or might not be able to prevent uh, mass flooding and so forth 100 years in the future. I'm very much in favor of spending tangible dollars on tangible things, very much in favor of in putting America and Americans first. And uh, if we quit police in the world, we wouldn't create these humanitarian situations like exist today in Yemen. Howie. Well, the first thing is to stop sending arms uh, for that war via mainly Saudi Arabia, selling them arms. Uh, we need to pressure the Saudis. Uh, they depend on a good relationship with the U.S. We have some influence there. We should use diplomacy. And we have to look back because remember in Obama they had the Yemen solution. They won't replace in response to the Arab Spring, people rising up for their rights and for bread. Uh, the response was, well, we'll replace the vice president. We'll put the vice president in the president's situation. And they called that the Yemen solution. Like, we can dictate to those people what their solution is without dealing with the underlying causes. So we can't, that's not the kind of diplomacy we need. We need the kind of diplomacy that helps people resolve the differences. In Yemen, that whole Middle East, North Africa area, we have a bigger refugee crisis than any time since World War II, the end of World War II. And that's because we've militarily intervened and destabilized these societies and people are running away from conflict. We got the same thing in Central America where we stage coups, like in Honduras. And now that's a narco state and people are running up here seeking refuge. And so we've got to find a way to deal with the human right of movement, which was in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at that time in 18, 1948 to deal with countries that had internal passports like South Africa and China and Russia or the Soviet Union back then. But now it's global because we're in a global economy. We got a global crime crisis, so we need to extend that freedom of human movement across borders. If we're gonna deal with this refugee crisis in a peaceful way rather than a militaristic way, we got to have open borders like they do within the EU, like they do within the Indian nations, like they do within those Central American nations. We need that for our whole hemisphere. And we need to find a way to do it around the world. There needs to be more people being able to get into Europe from countries like Syria, which they're trying to do right now, and they're, they're trapped. So it's a huge crisis that Yemen is just one example of. Thank you, Howie. All right, so next question. For Brock here, should we continue the war on drugs and why? Do you support decriminalization of all drugs? Um, we should end the war on drugs. We know with a preponderance of evidence at this point that it is not working. Locking people up in jail or in prison 
for doing things that are only harming themselves is not the answer. It is not a criminal justice issue. This is a social or mental health issue. And a lot of the things that we call drugs, we're starting to learn might be medicines that are treating things like PTSD and assisting our veterans, cannabis included, for example. And a lot of the things we've historically called medicines are starting to look like very dangerous drugs. This country has an opioid epidemic. My mother had a basic surgery and she was dying because she started taking oxycodone. Cannabis saved her life. She is here with my daughter uh, in Denver with me now. We have sufficient data in Portugal, in Switzerland, and other places around the world that have shown us that there are alternative ways to addressing these problems, some of which are not a problem. Some of the things we're learning, uh, I know here in, the, in Colorado, you've decriminalized uh, psilocybin, which is also something being used to treat PTSD. I'm a, a substantial donor to an organization called MAPS, which is also treating veterans. And we have really great data, near to have FDA approval to support trauma. This country has a very real mental health problem. And because it's not visible, it often goes undiagnosed. And coming out of this pandemic and this state of fear that we're in, we are going to have to find a way to collectively heal as a nation. It's a very real deal. Gloria. Well, uh, Brock mentioned an interesting point, and that is uh, that the, the legal drugs, like the opioids, have killed hundreds of thousands of people since they were invented by the Sackler family, the Sackler family that invented OxyContin and proceeded to pump hundreds of millions of pills into small towns throughout the US, paying doctors to overprescribe and creating a devastation for the United States. How many families suffered the loss of their loved ones? and really also face ruination by this addiction. I don't think the answer is legalizing. I don't think the answer in solving the crisis of, of drugs and substance abuse lies in the legalization. I think it lies in prosecuting those like the Sackler family, which is currently right now trying to hide all their billions of dollars in tax shelters so they don't have to pay reparations to the victims of, those, of that crime of theirs. Marijuana, of course, it should be legal. And there are med medicinal uses for it. But I, I, don't, I don't think that legalizing and making available in this corporate system heroin, methamphetamines, crack, is useful for the people. Um, instead, poor people go to jail for that. Nobody should be put in jail for addiction. People need help. There needs to be clinics. There needs to be hope and economic opportunity for people, for the youth who are forced into informal employment because they don't have formal employment. They have no opportunity. The real criminals are the banks that launder the drug money, the major international drug trafficking, like um, Wachovia, which laundered $378 billion, proven, was uh, put to court and paid a 2% fine. It's documented. Uh, the banks are responsible for it. And, um, but the poor pay the price. Thank you. Don. No, we should not end the war on drugs, but we should change it a great deal. I think Gloria is speaking in the right direction. The drug companies have gotten by with murder. Uh, West Virginia led the nation, uh, which is my home state, in opiate drug deaths. It's really sad to see it. It's destroyed entire communities. At times, there were as many as a million pills distributed in towns of four and 500 people through the pharmacies by uh, drug distributors and the major drug companies that we're familiar with. Uh, it is outrageous. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, having been in prison with drug dealers. Uh, there's a lot of bad drug dealers out there, people that make millions of dollars dealing drugs. So there are 
uh, illegal drug dealers that there needs to be a war on. There are drug companies that there needs to be a war on. But people who get addicted to these drugs many times need to be treated as victims of the drug epidemic and uh, the drug companies and so forth. And so I don't think we need to end the war on drugs. I think we need to refocus it. Uh, I think there's too many people in power that are making a lot of money. Going back to what I said earlier, if you look at uh, the money that's contributed to sitting U.S. senators, U.S. House members, and so forth, a lot of it comes from drug companies. And that's why many times the laws aren't changed or enforced that would prevent such behavior. But uh, there is no question that the drug uh, business in this country has destroyed a lot of people's lives and uh, taken a lot of lives and destroyed a lot of families and has made much of the country non-productive. It is, you'd have to go to some uh, inner city places like Detroit or the southern West Virginia and see what happens. But one thing that happens, which even President Trump recognizes, is that inactivity leads to drug addiction. And so we need to get more people back to work and quit uh, lying to the American public about what the unemployment rate is, return manufacturing to this country, and uh, make us prosperous and great again. Howie? Well, the war on drugs is another war that this government lost. Since it was declared there are more people using drugs than when they started this war on drugs. It's become a business. The war on drugs has become a business, and it's been targeted at particularly black and Latino and indigenous communities. They're prosecuted disproportionately compared to white people who use drugs at the same rates. So we need to legalize marijuana, treat it like alcohol and tobacco, tax and regulate it. And the other drugs we don't legalize, we decriminalize for, personal, uh, for possession for personal use. And those people get a appearance ticket like to do in Portugal, meet with a doctor, a social worker, and a lawyer, and they look at what they can do to improve your situation. Do you need drug treatment? Do you need counseling because you're using the drugs to cope with another problem? Do you need a job just to stabilize your life? And that would might resolve the problem. And as I mentioned earlier, less people now use hard drugs in Portugal than they did when they started that program in 2001. Um, so we still prosecute the drug providers both the corporate ones we've already talked about and the ones in the informal economy that bring these illicit drugs in. But if you're a user, you're not going to jail, you're going to get help. And the people that's in prison should be released if they're in there for personal possession. And we really need this decriminalization of hard drugs because we've got this opioid epidemic. And a lot of people are dying and they don't go for help because they're criminals and you know, they, they're afraid they'll get charged. So. We need to decriminalize possession for personal use so those people can go get what help's provided. It needs to be expanded. We should have a Medicare for All system where all medically necessary services are provided, including drug treatment. And then we need reparations for this war on drugs. That should be part of the discussion of that bill to study and develop reparations for African Americans. That's H.R. 40 in the House. Maybe we need a truth and reconciliation process for these communities that, by public policy, have been devastated by this war on drugs, black and Latino and indigenous communities, so that we can uh, make those communities whole. Yeah. Brian. Well, I'm going to agree. What needs to be punished is not the use of these drugs, but anybody who is turning a profit on somebody else's misery, which would include the, the drug companies that are pushing this uh, pushers um, and and those who have private prisons who are making money by keeping these people uh, incarcerated uh, and so and I look at it as a bigger thing too it's not just a local thing you know our drug usage has destabilized Central America so a lot of the people who are arriving at our borders uh, looking for someplace safe uh, they're, they're escaping from the situation that our drug use has caused. We do want to reduce our drug use. And it does mean better jobs. It does mean uh, providing hope for our people. Uh, but it does not mean locking people up who have become the victims of these influences. One caution, though, as a teacher, uh, I know that 
uh, studies have shown that the human brain is still developing until the age of 25 and that uh, marijuana has a retarding effect on the development of the human brain. I would like to see, in the same way that we did with tobacco, with warnings and education, I would like to see a, uh, an expanded uh, effort uh, in education to, to let kids know uh, what the problems are so that we have fewer young people uh, risking that kind of brain damage. Thank you, candidates. A few more questions and then closing statements will be coming. So two or three more questions. We'll go a little bit after nine since we started a little bit after six. So medical experts at the World Health Organization have called for global mandatory vaccination. What solutions would you provide in support or as an alternative to vaccination? Gloria. I don't think there is an alternative to vaccination. Uh, I think that in the matter of the COVID virus, there has been so much misinformation by Trump and the White House that has confused people. I think it is so reprehensible what he has done to use the media, to use his power in saying it's fake, saying it will disappear, telling people don't be afraid of it, don't let it dominate your life. And all of his narrative, this outrage of these seven, eight months now, has allowed for millions of people to say, Trump says it's fake, it's fake. And so they also, that also feeds into the idea that they're not going to trust the vaccine. I think that his claim that he's going to make sure that the vaccine's available for, before election day has created a lot of distrust in people to be vaccinated. Uh, I think overwhelmingly science shows that vaccination is needed. What's needed is education. And what's needed is uh, research and development of vaccines and drugs free of the profit motive. This is the problem. The profit motive distorts the whole issue of development of drugs, of distribution, sale, simply for profits. And I think that's part of the problem why people some people don't trust vaccination, but I think it's absolutely necessary. Great. Don? Now, this issue of vaccinations is an issue in my own home. Uh, my daughter refuses to vaccinate her children out of the fears of, that she reads about uh, the illnesses that can result and uh, what's in these vaccinations, which is uh, many being taken in a single shot. Uh, at the same time, I believe in vaccinations because I lived during a period of time, but uh, polio was a fear. And, you know, we've seen lots of uh, things out there that do great harm to people if they're not vaccinated. Uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of people die every year from preventable illnesses that vaccinations would prevent. So uh, I think vaccinations are uh, better than to have them than to not have them. But at the same time, it's very difficult to force people to have a vaccination that they simply, particularly an American, under the, under the Constitution that doesn't want to have it. So it, it's a very uh, difficult issue because there's a, a good argument on both sides. I personally think that uh, in 90% in of the cases, we need to be taking the vaccinations that we're asked to take. Having said that, uh, no one distrusts this government more than I do. I know firsthand what kind of government we've got, what kind of media we've got, what goes on at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Board because I was on it, what goes on at major international board members' meetings because I was on them, uh, what goes on in small towns that have uh, been raped by opiate drugs and so forth because I've lived in them, how poor people live and how rich people live. So I've seen the whole spectrum. Uh, but I can tell you that these uh, questions are not yes and no answer questions. They are more complex than that, very difficult to address in two minutes. But if you did away with all the vaccinations in the world, uh, you would think that COVID-19 was a picnic. Howie. Yeah, I'm, I'm against mandatory vaccination. They don't create more problems in getting people vaccinated than if we do it by education. He mentioned the polio vaccination. 
I mean, I was a little kid. I got, I was told I'd get a sugar cube. That's what it was in, you know? I did, that's all the education I needed. But people, polio is a serious disease, and we didn't have to do it, but it was there and it was free. And that's the way we need to get people vaccinated. And in this case, with they politicizing, you know, the Center for Disease Controls and the whole process of this vaccination, you know, the fastest vaccination we ever, or vaccine we ever got was mumps, four years. Now we're trying to do this in a year, and you need phase three studies that are longer term to see if they're negative consequences. We've been through this before in the Florida administration with politics dictating. They, they went out and vaccinated a whole lot of people, and just a good number of people got sick with a very serious neurological disease. We don't want to make that mistake again. And personally, if they do try to do that, I want the right to say no. So I'm against government. Uh, mandating vaccines. On the other hand, I think vaccines are great. They've been one of the biggest health, public health advances we've had in modern times. So, uh, yeah, get vaccinated, but the government shouldn't force you. Brian. I'm current on all my vaccinations, and I intend to stay that way. But I agree. It's the mandatory part that's the problem. And the fact that there is so much money by companies that are so powerful that they can force some vaccines to be mandated that maybe are not necessarily mandated or should be mandated. And we have uh, authorities at the CDC and who that are you know, personally invested in some of these companies. That needs to be stopped. Uh, we need to know, we need to be able to trust that the vaccinations that are being suggested to us uh, are not being suggested to us for mandatory uh, use because of somebody going to make some money on it. Uh, we need to do more to get uh, the profit motive out of medicine completely. There's also uh, an ethical thing here. Uh, we know that some of the research uh, that the, the, when the companies were procuring uh, aborted babies uh, and working at UC San uh, um, UC uh, San Francisco, uh, they were working on things like Parkinson's, which ought to be, you know, we want to study and solve those things, but they were requiring uh, babies uh, that were viable at the time that they were shipped from the abortion facilities to the, to the, med, to the research facility. And as soon as you introduce the fact that you're killing one human being for the help and health safety of another human being, you've got enormous uh, ethical problems. And we, we can't allow uh, both money problems and ethical problems, uh, life for a life, uh, to get in the way of our, our vaccinations. Brock. I am strongly opposed to mandatory vaccines, meaning where you don't have a choice where the government can choose to inject things into your muscles or bloodstream without your consent. I am strongly opposed to mandatory. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I think that there are vaccines that may be very good for you considering you know, what that issue might be. I will not be taking uh, a COVID vaccine. No chance <laughs> that I will be taking a vaccine that has not been sufficiently tested because I'm not really at risk. And I would advise some people to seriously consider it if you are at risk. As someone that is a very, very low risk, I will not be taking it. It has not been sufficiently tested. Scientific method has not been applied. A lot of it is being done with gene editing technology, RNA, meaning once you've received it, depending upon the vaccine, you are permanently a genetically modified human. These are kind of serious things that you want to take into consideration before you accept something new. Um, I would encourage any politician that thinks that they should mandate this to be the first to be tested. Uh, that seems appropriate. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I think it'll be our military that will be tested first. Uh, and again, there's not been sufficient testing here. Uh, if you're at risk, you should be volunteering to do that. And I think there's, just in vaccines in general, there's a, a, a problem where there's a very major misalignment in, of incentives. Typically, the scientific method is not being utilized when vaccines are being created, and the companies that are creating them have zero liability. 
meaning we've got a very strong perverse economic incentive in place, meaning they can capitalize as much as they want, and if something doesn't work out, those losses are socialized to taxpayer through, by way of our government. This happened in the 80s, and these are, you know, I'm, I'm an incentives person. I'm a systems designer. What you incentivize, you get. I will not be taking that vaccine. Okay. All right, well, we're getting close to the end here. I'd like to use a minute, please, of mine. Ahead. First of all, I, in answer to something that Brian Carroll said, it is not babies that have been used in research and for development, uh, medical development, as you stated in San Francisco. There is fetal tissue that has been used. Stem cell research, remember how Bush was against it when it is such a life-saving research that's needed for, for science. But in addition, uh, the, the monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies that Trump got that nobody else has in, is entitled to came from fetal tissue research. So he's being a hypocrite himself as well. I defend a woman's right to abortion a woman's right to reproductive rights, a woman's right to equality, a woman's right to control our own bodies and our privacy. Anybody oh, else? I have 15 more seconds. And also, I am for education. You know, the problem is like your individual right not to, not to uh, protect society. It's this individual American right, but you're also infecting other people with illness. If you think you don't have to wear a mask, you don't have to vaccinate the problem? Uh, yeah, uh, I think th that the information that Gloria is working with uh, is old information. And one of the things that's come out of that trial in San Francisco uh, is that for many years, uh, abortion facilities have been custom tailoring their abortions to provide certain organs uh, to research labs, and it's against the law to do that, to sell body parts, but they have been doing it. That's what David Daladin and Senator Merritt were investigating with all their films, uh, and those films have been locked up uh, illegally. Those were journalistic things, uh, research that was done, and uh, it, because they are exposing a very powerful uh, organization in our society, uh, they have faced all kinds of unfair um, retribution. And the, if the juries were allowed to see the information, were allowed to see the videos, uh, that would become public knowledge. And they, the juries have not been allowed to see those videos. Don, please. <laughs> One thing I think is important because we've touched on a lot of things and I just wanted to make it sort of a tidbit thing, but the, we have uh, wasted more money, if you will, on the stimulus packages than the total cost of China imports in ever altogether. You know, for the last 30 years or so, we have not paid the Chinese as much for products that we were importing from them as we are going to spend on the COVID-19 virus. It's just an incredible situation. Uh, vaccinations, the, the government under the Constitution does have the right to promote the general welfare. I think there's a, a reasonable argument there, as Gloria was making, that it's not just you that's being protected from a vaccination or, for that matter, a mask. It's other people. And promoting the general welfare is very important. And lastly, the biggest problem we have in this country is legalized corruption. Uh, basically, the government is able to pass laws that allows them to do things that are illegal because they're not in compliance with the Constitution, and therefore it's very difficult to stop. Anyone else? All right. Well, I have one more question. I could do two. If we do two, I would do two-minute response on the next one. And the final question will be um, one more question on our screen for a one-minute response. Are all candidates OK with that? To have a two-minute response, if I were to ask a question now, and then I want to ask a second question or have somebody on the TV ask, and all candidates would respond for just one minute. And then what happens after that? Closing statement. OK. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right, everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. So just for time, timeliness here. So, okay, great. All right, over to Howie. With the recent shooting in Kenosha, Wisconsin, involving armed citizens, the Second Amendment is once again 
at the forefront of media conversation. What reforms, if any, would you take on gun legislation? Well, I think we can work within the framework of that Holder decision, uh, which said law-abiding citizens have a right to firearms, pistols, rifles, shotguns, but the public has a right to regulate access and possession of those uh, firearms in the interest of public safety. So then the devil's in the detail of, of what those regulations should be. I think we should have universal background checks. I think uh, requirements for safe storage or maybe training before you take possession of the arm or uh, a waiting period so you're not getting the Saturday night special because you're angry. And maybe if you cooled down for a few weeks, you wouldn't use it against who you were thinking you were going to use it against. Those kind of regulations, I think, should be up for debate, and they might vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I don't want to see assault uh, weapons on the street, you know, military assault weapons. I had an M16 in the Marine Corps. Uh, those kind of weapons can kill too many people too fast. You don't need them for self-defense or for hunting. And uh, so I would like to see a buyback program for them. So, you know, that's pretty much my, my feeling about firearms. Now, you know, that kid that had an AR-15, I mean, he just shows up like he's going to be Rambo or John Wayne. Young kid's 17. He shouldn't even have had the firearm to begin with. Ends up shooting three and killing two. You know, that's the kind of nonsense we go. Beyond the possession of firearms, we got a macho culture here where people think the gun makes them a real person. You get little people in the hood shooting at each other because the gun is a great equalizer. And, you know, that's something we got to address in a lot of ways. And that requires education and also requires getting at the roots of a lot of street crime and violence, which is poverty. You know, it's a rich country. We shouldn't have poor people concentrated in our communities where they all are segregated and isolated and concentrated. Thank you. Brian. A, a president does not get to do a lot by executive order. In, and this is one of those areas where uh, Congress should take the lead. Uh, I do support uh, red flag laws. Uh, I do believe that each jurisdiction in our country should have some leeway. Uh, we don't need the same laws in uh, Montana as we need in some of our inner cities. But I think it's important that uh, Congress takes the lead on this. And obviously the courts are going to get pulled into it. And the president probably has the least to say about it. And uh, so as, as a president, I would leave it that way and hope Congress would take the lead. Yeah. Brock. I support the, uh, the Second Amendment and our right to bear arms. I, uh, I grew up in Minnesota, and so I grew up in a place where hunting was common practice and saw the benefits that that provided to preservation of wildlife. I agree that this is a, you know, a congressional issue and states and cities should have their say. The mass shootings you know, are the thing that really bring this into um, you know, makes it a very difficult topic because it's, it's just utterly heartbreaking to see what's been happening and how we are harming each other. I'm really concerned about the state of our nation right now. We are very divided. We are very polarized. Gun sales right now are off the charts by Democrats, by Republicans, the American people are arming themselves. I am very nervous about the potential of a civil war in the future. And uh, we really have to find a path forward collectively. We have to find a way to unite and understand that we have more in common than things that separate us. We have to realize that we've, we're in this together. Um, and I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned right now. Yes, I, I think something that Brian Carroll mentioned that I think really reflects the views of those who make the laws in this country about maybe rural areas don't need gun restrictions as much as they do in the urban cities shows that any gun restriction, black people aren't allowed to have guns. 
Case in point, Philander Castile, who was legally licensed to carry a gun. And as a policeman approached his car with his partner in the front and his little four-year-old stepdaughter, that he said, officer, I'm licensed to carry a gun, and he was murdered instantly. That you have this young man in Kenosha carrying this AR-15 and getting high-fived by the cops and then let go, even though he walked up to the police after he shot at people. Um, and I, I think that points to also a very serious issue that most people don't know about. And that is the 2005 law that was passed in Congress after the lifting of the ban on semi-automatics. It was a ban from 1995 to 2004. And as soon as that ban was lifted, uh, Congress passed a law that said no gun manufacturer shall be liable for any suit by any victim. So the Sandy Hook parents, whose poor little six, seven-year-old children murdered, lost forever, went and sued federally, and they found out they have no right to sue. So every time you've seen these massacres, they just explode with advertisements. Buy your gun. It's time now. Feeding on people's fears, especially white people's fears. And so the, the issue of guns is a far deeper debate. I am not for, in, in, in this system, I think there are too many guns. I think there can be certain things like training, locking up your guns so that children are protected. There are many, many deaths in households from carelessness. And, but it's a, it's a very deep debate. But I think it's used against, uh, laws are used against black, Latino, and other people of color. Yeah. And Don? Yeah, and of course, this Second Amendment is sacred where I come from in West Virginia, and people don't look at uh, their ownership of guns as something that has to do with hunting or anything else. They look at it as protection. And uh, the type of gun they have, once you open that door to this government, it's hard to tell uh, where you'll end up. So uh, basically, I'm for 100% protection of the Second Amendment and uh, the use of guns. I think you can also look at Chicago and other cities that have tried gun control and, and see that it doesn't work. Uh, you know, the, the stickers that you might sometimes see if you ban guns, only the criminals will have guns. Uh, it's a tough situation, much like the drugs, the vaccines, and everything else. It's not a yes or no answer in many people's minds. Uh, you can have situations where people are deranged or they threaten someone, the, the protective order is need, you need to take their guns. If it's a legal process, uh, so to speak, one-off situations, I can understand. In fact, I would support it, uh, people being denied guns in that situation. But uh, to open up the door to the government taking people's guns at will and the passing legislation that would in any way limit the Second Amendment, I would very much oppose it. Thank you. We're going to move on to our final question. And we'll have one minute response to start with Brian. So here it is on the screen. The final question is... My name is Lynn Ulbricht, and my son, Ross, is serving a double life plus 40-year sentence without parole. All his charges are nonviolent. He's a first-time offender, and no victims came forward at trial. But Ross is not unique, as shocking as this sentence is, because there are over 17,000 nonviolent people serving life sentences in our country today. And I consider this a national disgrace and a human rights crisis. This is the land of the free, and it seems very ironic that we imprison more people than any other country on earth. It didn't used to be this way. Since the drug war, the um, prison population has metastasized 800%. If the prison population were its own state, it would be larger than 11 states. So this state of mass incarceration, um, to me, is a blight on our country and violates our American values of mercy and redemption. And general excessive sentencing is a real problem that must be stopped, in my opinion. Um, my question is, do you agree with that? Would you issue clemency to Ross and others like him who have not inflicted any violence on anyone? And 
who deserve a second chance. And to throw into that mix, would you issue clemency to other nonviolent people like Julian Assange and Edward Snowden and really not cage anyone who has not, is not a danger to society? That's my question. Thank you. Brian. Well, I definitely believe that we have much too many, far too many uh, people in prison. Uh, no question. And part of that is that we have people who are uh, making a profit off of prisons. Uh, if, if the state is, is running a prison as a, as a responsibility to the people, uh, they're going to do everything they can uh, to get people out as fast as they can. But when somebody has the right to, you know, somebody's in there for 10 years, and if they can be written up for a few uh, violations, then they can be kept a little bit longer. The incentive is there to keep the people longer and longer and longer and longer. And we have to remove that, that incentive. And yeah, uh, nonviolent people should not be uh, in prison. With the exception of, there are certain white collar crimes that have caused enormous uh, damage to people and they don't get punished severely. Rock. Lynn, always good to hear from you. Uh, I would love to reconnect after November 4th to further discuss the circumstances and situation of uh, Ross Ulbrich. Um, I'm already on record stating that I would pardon Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, and I believe there are many others like that. In the case of Ross Ulbrich, I can say that I know, I know that he was not given a fair trial. I know that the sentencing and the things that happened there were not fair. I can say that I would be committed to a retrial and committed to a conversation to understand if pardoning is the right answer. It is a conversation I would be willing to have. And that is also true of everyone else in a similar situation. Um, I'm, uh, I believe we should be the land of the free. And we are clearly not living that way. And I think that radical, massive reform is needed uh, in this department. Thank you. Gloria. I agree with Ms. Albrecht's uh, description about the crisis that has led to massive incarceration, excessive sentencing. I would also add we need to end racial profiling, abolish the death penalty. I have visited many prisons for over the years, including inmates who were later executed on death row in uh, Texas. Uh, one who I knew was absolutely innocent and was executed even though he was convicted at the age of 17. The Supreme Court later ruled it was unconstitutional. But prisoners need major reforms also in prison. Many, the vast majority don't belong in prison. And even those who were convicted of violent crimes, many falsely convicted. Uh, people have served their time unless you can definitely be proved, you know, a, a violent serial rapist, a murderer. Well, there is a case for that. But I think many, many people do not belong in prison. Human rights must be respected. Give them proper food. Give them the right to education. Stop the torture cells. Stop the isolation. Stop the torture of prisoners inside. They deserve human rights. Oh, yeah, I said so before. Assange. Mumia Abu Jamal, Matula Shakur, Jalil Muntakim, Leonard Peltier, there are many. And Ross Ulbricht, or no? Yes, sure, I yes. So. Oh, yes. I, sure. I, I was adding to what she said. Right. I, I have a minute. So. <laughs> Don. Now, having spent time in a private prison, I probably know more about it than most people ever want to know. Uh, but let me tell you, there are people in there, like a young man that at 18 years old, transporting marijuana across state lines while armed spending 30 years in prison. Again, he never really hurt anybody. Uh, and I think they paid him $50 to drive the truck. So it, it's really a disgrace, but Americans need to educate themselves, not just on what goes on in the prison, but why these people are in there. The, uh, the laws that are on the books are violated. The Constitution's violated. Learn about the words Giglio, Brady, Jinx, and you'll learn 
what the government is supposed to do to properly convict someone in a trial, but what they do is totally different. In my case, it was an atrocity that even the Office of Professional Responsibility of the DOJ wrote down a hundred things that the prosecution did illegally and improperly, and yet they still would not reverse the conviction, and I was sent to prison for a year for a misdemeanor. Wow. Howie. Well, yes, of course we have excessive sentencing. We have the largest prison system in the history of the world. Like COVID, 4% of the world's population, in this case 25% of the world's prisoners. So one thing to do when people are convicted of crimes, but they're not a threat to society, they're alternatives to incarceration, restitution, community service, and also helping people who may have issues get them resolved so they can reintegrate back into society more productively. That's a much more constructive way to deal with uh, crime than locking people up and basically send them to cr criminal school because when they come out, they don't have any way of getting employment, housing. They come out broke. They've been working like slaves for no pay in these different jobs. So clemency, yes. For, I've said it before, for Snowden, Assange, Peltier, Mumia, there are a lot of whistleblowers, as well as political prisoners, they should be released. You said Ross Ulbricht, too? I don't know the case. I mean, she said he did nonviolent crime and he's in there forever. It doesn't sound right. I'm not familiar with the case. So um, we're going to have closing statements, and it's a wrap. So uh, next up to Brian, Brock, you get to do your closing statement. Two minutes. Well, I am grateful, grateful to have been part of this debate with my fellow presidential candidates. I'd also like to thank all of you that have shown up to watch this debate, everyone that helped make this happen, and most importantly, to the organizers and the moderator of this debate, Christina Tobin, for having a dream and doing the work to realize that dream in creating this fair and open space for presidential candidates beyond the limited two choices. I have a dream to heal what feels like the divided states of America right now so that we can be these united states of America again. I have a viable plan to actualize this dream. The economic shutdown is killing the American dream. Technology and automation are replacing many of our jobs. The road ahead will be challenging. Nelson Mandela once said, a nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. We don't have a resource problem in this country. We're the richest country in the world. We have a resource allocation problem, an efficiency problem, an accountability problem, an administration problem. I'm committed to stopping the expansion and centralization of the federal government and giving more choice to the states. As president, I will work to fully re-legalize cannabis and pardon and expunge every nonviolent cannabis offender trapped in our criminal, ju criminal justice system. How is it that I'm even having to say this? That as a presidential candidate, I'm being bold to say that we shouldn't outlaw nature? My priority as president of the United States of America will be to ensure the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for every American. This is our time. 43% of eligible voters in our nation are not voting, either because they believe their vote doesn't matter, they're not inspired by their choices, or they've lost faith in the system. The majority of Republicans and Democrats are not happy with the limited choices. By 2024, 38% of registered voters will be registered as independents, meaning we are the majority. We have been fooled into believing that we only have two choices. Now is the time to break free of this illusion. Not only is the fate of our nation at stake, but also the fate of humanity. Now is the time to act. Now is the time to vote your conscience. Now is the time to make decisions not based on fear, but out of love, out of principles, what you believe in. Now is the time for us to co-create the world in which we wish to live. So be it and so it is. Thank you. Gloria. Uh, do we have a still remaining minute that we can use? Not on the closing oh, statement. Oh, sure. I should have used it before. <laughs> OK. I want to thank the staff and the volunteers who I've seen before and who are very dedicated to Christina Tobin's vision of the open and free 
elections. I think it's an extremely important project. And I salute you for your perseverance, for everybody who's worked in this and created a professional presentation. And to my co-debaters, I think it was very civil and very educational. Um, I encourage the people watching and listening to visit my campaign website, lariva2020.org, L-A-R-I-V-A, and to read our party's and campaign 10-point program. It's an abbreviation of what we call for. And also you can read the newspaper, liberationnews.org, chock full of up-to-date news on what has taken place, our analysis of the crisis. I think the biggest indictment of the capitalist system is the fact that the biggest corporations, Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter, General Dynamics, all these corporations have made the largest rate of profit ever in history and paid virtual or no taxes while we, the people, have suffered in untold illness and 210,000 deaths and are suffering poverty and a future where we don't know if we'll have a home or, a, or be able to feed our kids. This is capitalism and why I call on everyone to check our website, check our party. Uh, I think more and more people are looking to socialism and certainly many people are, are joining our party and joining the socialist movement, the struggle against racism, the struggle against all forms of discrimination. To say that we live in the richest country in the world, the people must have the power, the workers, the people, who work and create all wealth in society should be able to control it to create a sustainable envir environment, save the planet and humanity. No war, no sanctions, no coup. Thank you. Don. Yeah, I, think, I think the debaters here and to a great extent the American people are uh, reflecting on how to save the country. I think the common belief is the country's in trouble. But uh, the answers that are promoted are systems and platforms that have failed in other countries like Venezuela, or they're more of what we've been doing, like the Green New Deal, illegal immigration, and uncontrolled rioting and violence, or there's something that's a mix in between that's not clear. The only platform represented here tonight that has proven it works was the U.S. Constitution. It made this country the envy of the world. It made it the bastion of freedom. It made it the place that people want to come to legally or illegally. We need to return to the Constitution, as I said, go back to the future and recognize that God is what creates people that are equal. The government cannot make people equal through laws. And when they try to do that, all they do is take uh, rights away from some races to give privileges to others and create animosity. We have to go back to, to what we know works. That's what I encourage us to do. We've, uh, we've got to continue to, to lessen the drug abuse in this country, as we, as we discussed. We've got to quit policing the world. Uh, we've got to stop uh, dialogue about making guns illegal and drugs legal. Uh, there's so many things that need to be fixed, but we should not be fooled by the fact that uh, it might be popular to do X, Y, or Z, we need to rely on cost benefit and rely on what we've learned from other countries and from our own behavior. Howie. Well, thank you, Christina, for being equal and open to debates and everybody that sponsored this. We obviously don't agree on everything, but I don't think any of us interrupted each other. So I think, you know, the, the major party candidates Check us out. This is how you have a civilized discussion despite differences. So I'm the Green Party candidate for president, and I'm running with uh, Angela Walker, who's a veteran labor and racial justice activist. She's for vice president. She's in, down in uh, Florence, South Carolina. And we're asking for your vote. We're on 30 ballots on the ballot. It represents 381 electoral votes. That's 73% of voters and well over the 270 we need to take the White House, which Angela keeps saying, we came here to take the White House. We'll see, but, you know, we, we, we're serious. We'll also be on 17 more ballots, representing a total of 514 of 538 possible electoral votes. So 96% of Americans will be able to vote for us. 
And we're particularly appealing to the socialists and progressives because the way the polls have been going, Trump has been toast since the spring. Biden's been clearly ahead. It's going to be a historic landslide, and it's bumped up since Trump went to that disastrous debate. So the question for socialists and progressives is, how are you going to vote against Trump? You going to vote for Biden against the Green New Deal, against Medicare for All, against ending the endless wars, and get lost in the sauce where they're going to take you for granted because you voted against what you stand for? Or are you going to vote for the Green Party and the things you do stand for and make your vote count and make the public and the politicians hear you and your fellow socialists and progressives because after the election, we're going to keep fighting for these things. Trump is out of there if the mail-in ballot is counted. So we all got to be ready to make sure that happens because the Democrats rolled over for the Republicans in Florida in 2000. We ain't going to let that happen this time. Go to HowieHawkins.us to find out more about our campaign. And uh, thank you again. Brian. I also want to thank you, not just for this one, but for the one in Chicago, too. A lot of work went into all of these, and uh, I hope it becomes... Uh, widespread and that even other organizations would pick up the idea. As a Christian, I believe that every human being starts with the right to, to human dignity. And it starts in the womb, but it, there's no exception that rules out people when they go behind bars or when they are living in a, a blighted area of an inner city uh, or when they are uh, drinking dirty water in some of our cities. Everybody deserves the respect and dignity of being a human being. And we have a society that has lost that. Whether it's because money is more important than people to many of our businesses, or for whatever reason it is, we've lost it. And we need to get back to the fact that the basic unit of society is the family in strong communities built on local businesses, that social justice is deserved by everybody. It's a, it's a horrible crime that uh, black maternal death is four times white maternal death. Those are the problems that we have to solve. Uh, nobody should be making money on somebody else's misery. Uh, we need to be giving everybody uh, access to quality health care. Um, abortion is not health care in my mind, but everybody should have uh, excellent access to health care. Uh, we want an economy built on small businesses and opening it up to new entrepreneurs. Uh, we have got to solve the climate problem. Every other problem pales if we don't have air to breathe and we have refugees running from the climate disasters every place into every other nation creating uh, war and disruption. Uh, we've, we've got to solve that or we will not be able to ever have peace on our planet. Well, we are, it's a wrap. The debate is a wrap. Thank you for all the candidates for sitting here for over three hours straight. And a huge shout out and thanks again to the lot here in Rhino District, the whole production team, uh, just rocking it back to back with from United We Stand, presenting right down stairs here to the debates. and. You know, these candidates tonight, I don't know about all of you, but for me, they give me hope. They give me hope that there's great people in the world that want to bring about great changes. And the idea and the movement, however it may be, is truly bigger than any one person. And I uh, definitely want to end on the note of, um, you know, Pete Seeger. Probably, I uh, wish he was still here with us today. Probably one of the biggest inspirations in music because he brought people together and united them. And his words resonate with me on a daily basis of, uh, we shall overcome. Um, we will uh, overcome, <laughs> it is written. <laughs> so um, on that note, um, I wanted to end. Uh, we are going to have an open party, a bar, an open bar and party that is at Lester Pearl downtown after the debate now to mingle, as I mentioned at the beginning, and meet local press and members. We can take a bus from here. And it's at 1315 26th Street. And it will be returning to the Source Hotel after the party is over. Uh, Brock Pierce is actually providing his bus to anyone who wants to go. And he asked uh, me to invite all of you candidates to join.
So I hope you can make it. It would be great to hang out with you guys outside of the debate if you're building up to it. And thanks again to the whole team, the United We Stand team, uh, all the people that have helped with so many moving parts throughout the years and decades. Thank you. <laughs> we shall overcome. Mm -hmm.